Welcome, everybody, to the Live Geek Cast. Um, uh, I'm joined today with some very special people. Those people happen to be from Perch Security. Uh, Riggs and Wes, welcome. Thank you. Awesome uh, to be with you. Yeah. Uh, I'm also joined by Mindy, one of our other fearless leaders. Hey, everyone. Long time to see. Uh, don't mention that. Don't mention that. That doesn't happen, okay? We, we do regular <laughs> geek casts. It hasn't been like six months, okay? Um, so, uh, I uh, have got a few announcements, a few things to, to poke at, and then uh, I'm going to let the security experts secure things. Um, and uh, we'll just we'll Hey, just we begin. have security experts on? Uh, yeah, they're in the chat. Um, someone from Huntress Labs, I think it was? No, okay, cool. That's cool. <laughs> oh, we know those guys. What's up, Kyle? What's up, Andrew? Yeah, right. Uh, so, uh, the first thing I would like to... Uh, to, I'm going to plug some things. So I'm going to plug uh, MSP Geek Merch. We have a merch store for those who don't know. Uh, and it's an amazing merch store that Mindy keeps saying he's going to buy stuff on and is refusing to buy stuff. It's going to happen. Don't worry. See, um, I'm going to post the link uh, in all of the chats. Um, the web address itself is shop.spreadshirt.com slash MSP dash geek. Um, that, uh, benefits us. Um, we get a, uh, a cut of anything you happen to purchase. Um, so, uh, they're mainly printed items. Uh, and from what we've, the feedback we've gotten is they're pretty good quality. Um, so the, now that, uh, internal plug is, is, is done. Um, frankly, MSP is having, uh, a, you know, we, we broadcast about this a while ago in announcements channel, but frankly, MSP is still having their uh, conference, and as far as I know, there's still tickets available. Um, so if you uh, are interested in that or like, uh, hit me or Ashley up. You can just add Ashley in the channel. Uh, she's, she's around. She's always around. Uh, and also, PerchyCon is coming up uh, after, frankly, MSP's con. And uh, from what these two gentlemen say, there are still tickets available. Um, uh, should you... Uh, like to go to that um yeah and feel free to drop in the perch channel to ask all about that if you'd like yeah and we actually i think still have a promo code available msp geek all uppercase if you want 50 bucks off so oh, sweet um yeah. forgot about that uh so yeah if you want some some discounts uh i think there's still one available for uh frankly msp as well um i'm not sure if the shirt is still available i do not think so um but if you're still interested in that, I think the discount code still works. So, um, Sweet. So, uh, without further ado, uh, gentlemen, take it away. Right on. Well, of course, now I'm trying to, like, do things and stuff. You Hold had on. so long. I know. This is, <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, but all of a sudden we have this test. So... Um, I'm going to blame Wes for the PowerPoint presentation. We're going to like PowerPoint slide you to death. This no, we're not. <laughs> no, we're not. So we had a long discussion about this, and the only purpose for the PowerPoint is to direct our thoughts. But we're actually going to get pretty down and deep and, and show you some really cool tools that I think you guys will like. So uh, I guess maybe a, a little bit of uh, intro. So me and Riggs are next to each other right now, which makes this nice for us to uh, uh, probably play off each other a little bit more. So... Um, we are our background. We're both bankers, um, so you should definitely know that. And um, we were both very involved in uh, running our security programs at the banks we came from. And we had a big, um, I guess, a big background in threat intel sharing. And I think the big lesson we learned about threat intel sharing at banks is uh, we all suck at threat intel sharing. Uh, <laughs> would yes, you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's probably one of the more frustrating parts of the job. It is a uh, it's a broken it's a broken system that I think can be fixed and I think we have a long way to go um, and I think the more people that get in on threat intel sharing and start understanding like what it is and what it does for us the better off we all become uh, so that's definitely what we want to talk about today it's probably the biggest area of uh, interest I think both of us have um, it's a big piece of what Perch does but more than that I think it's a big piece that I think uh, you know I kind of saw the potential in it so that's what we wanted to talk about today absolutely yeah I think uh, I think it'll be a good time. Um, you know, uh, I think threat intelligence uh, is one of those things that is uh, something that is not well understood, um, uh, you know, at least beyond uh, the basics of it. And so doing a little bit of a deep dive, I think, will be great for the community. So, Kyle, and um, 
Mindy, curious what you guys think. Like, what do you think the average MSP thinks about when it comes to threat intel? Do you guys think that they're, uh, what, what would you kind of summarize and, and uh, explain where you think most MSPs are at? Mindy, don't answer this because you're different than everybody else. <laughs> okay, now what am I supposed to do? Uh, well, you can answer <laughs> after I answer. How about that? Because I, I would okay, be considered a normal MSP, and you're the crazy MSP who knows everything. Um, so, uh, I think threat intelligence is, uh, kind of like a, uh, reactionary thing. So it's not, there's nothing really spread until it hits something major. So no one really, uh, <clears throat> no one really shares anything until they know of something affected, um, or they know of someone that they know is someone is affected. And then it just kind of blows up from there as a reactionary major issue. There's no, uh, to my information, at least, uh, there's no central, uh, you know, repository or anything where I can easily find um, threats. Yeah. Okay. Right on. Mindy? Uh, Kyle said basically what I was going to say. I mean, oh, honestly, no. Perch was like the first kind of threat intel sharing that I even heard of in, ter in terms of an MSP. Uh, not to plug you guys or anything, but I just did. <laughs> Yeah, cool. So, um, no, I'm and I, I'm with you. Uh, so I, I do like uh, I like that term you gave, Kyle. Um, it is pretty reactionary. It's like this idea of how can I give uh, my peers and those around me some kind of actionable information about the threats that I'm seeing at my organization, and how can you do the same back for me? Right? We strengthen our security postures. Um, we are a lot more um, nimble and quick to respond. So, like, the big thing, I, I relay this when I speak at conferences a lot. I talk about this, like, herd behavior, right? So think about it for a minute. Like, we've all seen those, like, Netflix documentaries of, uh, you know, some kind of predator on the plains chasing, like, buffalo or whatever those big old animals are in, in whatever country uh, have you. And they're chasing the animals, right? And all of a sudden, as a herd, the whole herd together moves in unison, right? And they've learned through, you know, millions and millions of years that operating together in a herd together is the best way to defend yourself against a threat. Now, of course, like, you're always going to have, you know, it's the weak and the young uh, that are usually the ones that the predator ends up getting. But it's the most fascinating thing. Like, you see all these 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 uh, predators in the chase you see the herd running in unison and all of a sudden the herd says like enough is enough they stop they turn around and they face the predator and the predator has to stop because they can't fight the whole group of everybody right but always there's always like the baby or like the old buffalo or whatever it is that gets left behind and those are the ones that get torn down right and, and i think that lesson uh there's a lot of truth to that in the world of like cyber threat intel sharing too um if we can get better at doing this and we can truly share together and be aware of things together um there, there's so much more power in the herd does that does that make sense yeah awesome so really um we want to talk a little bit about uh you know, what is this whole threat intelligence thing? Uh, and, you know, we aren't really big on buzzwords. Uh, you know, we, we think most of them are BS uh, and uh, driven by marketing to, to sell things. Um, and so really, you know, putting around uh, a, a good framework of, you know, what is threat intelligence? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's defined as, you know, what have I observed? What can I communicate uh, around a particular threat, be it in the physical world, be it in the virtual world, uh, you know, in the, cyber, in the cyberspace? Um, what do I know about an actor? What do I know about an adversary? Uh, do I know how they're operating and how can I detect that? You know, what, uh, what smoke signals can I see uh, on the network or, you know, digital artifacts can I find? around that. I mean, it's a, it, it really is a, a fairly basic concept, um, but there are a lot of challenges in that. You know, everything that ranges from legal uh, all the way up to actually getting good intel, and I think that's a lot of the stuff we wanted to cover today. Yeah, so, like, things that threat intel is not, like, uh, I see this all the time, uh, you know, threat intel is not just, like, a list of IPs, and, and I'm about to show you a list of stuff here in a minute, uh, but that does not consummate and, like, make up what threat intel is all about. It's a piece of it, uh, but it's certainly not the whole the whole process, right? And it's definitely not, like, raw data that you get. Um, it's good to do those things. We're going to show you sources and ways you can grab all of that, but it's way, way, way more than that. Um, so, like, you know, this definitely came out of military concepts. Like, if you talk to anybody that comes out of, like, physical intel sharing out of military, I mean, this stuff has been around, this whole idea has been around for thousands of years. I mean, you look at, like, troop movements and, um, you know, all this goes back to, like, pre-Roman days, right? Um, the idea for us 
Bastos are sort of taking that same idea of, you know, who's our adversary, what are they doing, uh, what tools, what tradecraft, what uh, procedures, how, you know, how are they attacking, where are they coming from, all of these ideas of, you know, kind of looking at it from the, the world of um, bits and bytes and ones and zeros versus actual physical cyber threats, right? And so, you know, for us, usually when we're talking about cyber intel, we're, sh we're talking about like how we share a threat. What does that threat look like? Um, you know, and a lot of times at its base level, it's things like IPs and domains, right? I mean, we can go way beyond that, and we should go way beyond yeah. that. We're gonna we'll show some examples of this in a minute, um, but that's like the basic core of what it's all about. Um, and the way it gets made, so here's the cool thing. The way that it gets made is uh, there's really no right or wrong way to make intelligence. Um, usually an intelligence document of some kind, make it, it comes about once something happens, right? So like, let's use a common example. Let's say you get a phishing email, one of your employees, one of your clients reports it, and you take a look at it, and you're like, whoa, that's really good. Uh, let's let's dive in. And we're actually going to do that in a minute. We're going to pull up like a phishing email or an example of one, and we're going to start diving in and say, hey, how can we create intelligence around this that we can share out with others? and uh, what can we do about it. So I think this is kind of a cool pivot because I watched Kyle's um, uh, cast, uh, the last one you guys did, of like diving deep into malware. And this is going to be less about, you know, unpacking it and more about, you know, how do we grab it, how do we see it, and how do we share it. So it's a really good kind of next step that comes uh, after that. So uh, where it comes from, right? So like Intel can come from all kinds of places. And by the way, Kyle, we were just talking about this a minute ago. Um, I don't know if, uh, Mindy, you're familiar. Uh, I know, Kyle, that was news to you. The, the TSP ISAL, are you guys familiar with that? So um, uh, ConnectWise kind of announced that just uh, at yeah. IT Nation. Are you, are you familiar with it, Mindy? Uh, no, I don't think so. I was okay. at IT Nation, and I still haven't heard of it. <laughs> Did you sleep through the keynote? Uh, no, I'm no, I watched Probably, it. Probably, no Kyle. I, no, how dare you. I watched it on the big TV outside, but I may have missed that part. Yeah, I guess uh, it wasn't, well, I don't know, it was a few minutes worth. So. Yeah, it was, it was a couple of minutes. They, yeah. they were talking about it. Anyway, anyway. so what it is, it, it think when you think of like ISALs and ISACs, uh, we're not going to dive into like all of like the back end, like background of all that stuff, but these are basically like nonprofit cyber threat sharing groups, right? And they're awesome. Uh, there's all kinds of different ones that are out there. You can actually go to the National Association of ISACs um, and look at a big, long list, and there's actually even more than that. Riggs, what was that one we're working with recently, the Space ISAC? Yeah, Space up? ISAC uh, in Colorado Springs, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we're seeing like new ones come out all the time, and the, the whole purpose of these groups are like, hey, we just want to start sharing threats with one another. Uh, we, we want to band together because of some kind of commonality, right? And so th there's a new one that ConnectWise is sort of getting off the ground. Um, we're going to talk about it more later, but um, it's called the TSP ISAL, um, and it's specifically for MSPs, right? So it's pretty cool. Um, you can also see Intel sharing that's beyond just um, like ISACs. I mean, it can come from like federal government. We see a lot of that stuff, um, you know, open source stuff. And I'll tell you like one of the best sources for intelligence that I see is Twitter. Yeah. Um, really, really good stuff that comes out of a number of Twitter feeds. And we're even aware of some really cool GitHub projects that are like literally consuming intelligence that comes out of Twitter. Does all that kind of make sense? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's actually really interesting. I'm, I'm actually reading uh, the release of what you're talking about right now. Uh, article was posted on ConnectWise August 29th. The TSP ISAL is the first information sharing body dedicated to cybersecurity for TSPs that ConnectWise is working on getting off the ground. Um, so I'm a little distracted reading that. Oh, no, you're fine. But, um, for and, those who and, don't know, though, TSPs oh, are MSPs. We've been renamed, um, for those who aren't familiar. Well, I think it. I think it covers more than just an MSP, doesn't it? It's also like MSSP and a few. Like it's a technology service provider, not necessarily just an MSP. Yeah, they're looking at you know cloud service providers, bars, uh, right. you know, really anybody who's operating infrastructure on behalf of a third party. Yeah. So, All right. Yeah. Go for it. So let's let's enough PowerPoint, right? Like I'm trying to keep PowerPoint as low as possible. I really want to get into like stuff, right? <clears throat> I have to cough here. So um, I don't know. I my guess is you guys most most MSPs have probably never heard of MISP before. Um, MISP is a um, what's called a threat intelligence platform. What's really cool about it is it's uh, open source. So you can go download it today and start playing around with it. And I hope you guys do because it's really really awesome. Uh, Riggs, while I log in, you want to kind of talk about what a threat intel platform is and yeah. where it's used? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean. Mostly threat intel platforms originated uh, back with the really, really large organizations, uh, you know, the top 1% of the banks, uh, you know, those who had massive uh, 
um, you know, infosec programs and people to throw behind them. And they needed something to aggregate all the threat intelligence. And so uh, out came this, uh, this massive economy of, of threat intelligence platforms where you can go through and, and aggregate, you know, exactly that, um, track it, uh, create incidents or, or events uh, around them and, uh, you know, really look at the, uh, the tactics, tools and procedures that are used by, by some of the adversaries and start correlating them. All right, so let's do a quick tour. We're going to we're going to talk about this a little bit and then we're going to come back to it in more depth as we so one of the things we wanted to do is like show you, hey, how does an intel analyst think? Um, how does an intel analyst uh, get some kind of po like potential um, uh, piece of threat information that they may want to share out? How do they enrich it? Uh, how do they make it better in terms of, uh, you know, reduction of sharing like false positives that piss everyone off? <laughs> yeah. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, and then we're also going to kind of dive into uh, how you can build intelligence that's shared with others. But before I do it, let me just show you some intelligence. So uh, this is um, a misp instance we just spun up in our AWS. Uh, so you can hit it. We, you know, I, I, we don't care. We're going to tear it down here in a minute. So after this, after this uh, meeting's over. So we just literally spun it up so we can show you some things. So one of the things that exist inside of MISP um, is a whole bunch of different threat feeds. And there are feeds that you can, uh, that actually come right out of the box with MISP, which is really cool. And you can look at some of these, and uh, you guys just interrupt me if you see any that are interesting to you or me to talk about. Now, I, I'm not an expert on probably the majority of these. I know what a lot of these are for. Um, but what's really awesome is these are a whole bunch of like what you call OSINT or open source intelligence feeds that come in. Uh, and then you can enhance this as well, right? So there's like a lot of really great companies that are out there um, that produce intelligence as a feed is sort of like a professional. It's like what they do, right? Like one I would point to, I give a shout out to because they're really good at this and it's all they do. And that's what I like about them. There's a group called Intel 471. Um, so just as one example, they come out of like British intelligence uh, and this is what they do. So like they're tracking um, like adversary behavior. Uh, they're in the places those guys are in. They're taking malware. Um, they're aware of what it does, how it works. Um, they're reversing things very much, you know, probably a lot of like what Kyle was talking about and then producing intelligence that's consumable out of it. Right. And so that's kind of what these feeds are all about. Usually, not always, but usually there's an angle to a lot of these feeds, you know, that may be very focused on like this one right here on DGAs, like domain generated algorithms, right? So this is, in fact, we know Bambanek. Uh, Bambanek's a friend of me and Riggs, is uh, John yep. Bambanek. So he actually produces a feed of some of the malicious DGAs that they see, right? And so DGAs are like, you guys are probably seeing like all that malware that has like very strange domain names. And you're like, what in the world is that? It's usually a domain generated um, or a dynamically generated uh, algorithm that creates that domain name, right? So it's kind of a feed of some of those things. So there's a whole bunch of these that exist here, but let's just dive into one. So I was looking at a couple of these earlier, and by the way, so one of the natures of like really diving into threat intel today is it's it's very quickly changing. So some of the things that I looked at earlier today may not be here, and we're just going to kind of figure this out. So like I may show you some things, and it may not work, and we'll go back to another one. That's just part of the fun of all of this, right? So uh, Riggs, what do you think? Maybe looking at this Turla one? Yeah, we pop a look in that one. Looks okay, like it has a lot of tags, so I'm curious. <clears throat> all right, cool. So uh, I open this. So so keep in mind, this comes out of a threat intelligence feed, uh, and there's a lot of information around it. So this is what they would call an indicator. So an indicator is, is like some kind of document uh, where they're saying, hey, we want to publish some information that may be helpful and useful to you um, around a particular attack of some kind that we're seeing, right? So I can pull this guy up. Uh, the title of this guy is some kind of Turla PowerShell um, is really kind of all we know at the moment for this. Uh, we can see some tags around all of this. So MISP has this concept of galaxies, which is sort of like, I don't know, it's sort of like this idea of like there are some kinds of, um, uh, uh, I don't know what you call it, some kind of topics that are just so deep and rich. They create their own like galaxies, which have like their own tags and mechanisms inside of it. But none of that really matters here. Um, if I scroll down, this is really what is probably the most important for today, is you can see what they're publishing here, right? So they're actually showing some information here. Um, these are called indicators of compromise or IOCs, right? So um, we're getting a lot of things that are coming across here. We're getting some things like some file hashes coming across. We're getting uh, one URL down towards the bottom. Um, in fact, this one, though, is if you look right here, this is actually some information around uh, what this thread is all about. See over here, this ID Yes. In fact, none of these are all no. This is exactly what I was talking about. Some of the stuff we don't want to look at. Let me find one that has some better stuff in it. Um, uh, let's see. This one may be good. Let's check this one. I'm going to find something. 
There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, here we go. All right, so this one's a little bit different. Um, you can see the, the title here, Targeted Malware Attacks Against NGOs, linked to uh, Burmese government websites. All right, so now we have some kind of context, right? And then we can scroll down a little bit more, and we can see some of the information that they're publishing, right? So some analyst somewhere has done some research on this, and they're publishing back a bunch of things that we might want to look for within our own company, right? So some things like some MD5 hashes, some IPs, domains. Um, you can see other things, like that's just what they've published here, but there could be a lot of additional things here. Here as well. But notice when you look over here on this right side, this IDS feature, what this means is this tells MISP if this has been flagged, if any of these, these are called observables, if any of these have been flagged as a yes, then what that just means is, um, hey, this is something that we can consume and that we might want to look at and detect upon to say, hey, I, I, if I see the same thing in my network, I might want to dive in and start taking a look. Does all this kind of make sense so far? Yeah, totally. Um... Basically, it, it, it gives you a list of everything that someone somewhere has detected, um, whether it's, uh, you know, maybe malicious or not, and whether it's actually malicious. Is that what the yes means in the IDS section? So I wish it did. And that's a good, that's a, <laughs> a really salient question because it ought to. Like, in theory, yes. Uh, when the IDS uh, yes flag is set, it should mean detect on this because it's something that I would care about. But here's the deal. The biggest problem that one of the biggest problems we have in Intel sharing today is that oftentimes you see a yes flag checked and there are reasons why it should not be checked. Um, they, in some cases, it maybe it's a yes for a while and then it becomes a no. Uh, in other cases, um, it should never be a yes. And it's, it's funny, like we just pulled this one up at random. Look at this one right here. This mail, uh, t, what is this, t1.mailservice.com. Take a look at that. What do you think the chances of that guy being malicious are? Probably relatively low. Um, pulling up the URL now. Not so it's spelled so. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, versus, uh, let's look at some of these others that may exist uh, here. Uh, not a lot of other stuff here that's listed. Now we might want to, if we had the time. Notice right here, they actually give a write-up. This is flagged as no because we're not trying to detect on this. It's a URL that gives us some information around it. In fact, that's kind of poorly classified. MISP actually gives us the ability to classify something as like a reading link instead yeah, of research. a URL, which is yep. kind of aggravating. Uh, but anyway, we could go read up on this. But my point is, if we did some research on these domains here, I can almost guarantee you these are not malicious. And one of the things that we see a lot of times when intelligence is published is accidental inclusions of things that are benign in nature. Uh, yeah, in fact, Riggs is looking this up right now on so, uh, the domain. MailSecurityService.com is not registered to anyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, so we just, uh, I, I was just pulling that up. It, uh, it, it wasn't registered. It may have been squatted on uh, when this Intel was uh, created. So if you take a look right. at the uh, at the Intel creation date, we actually pulled some uh, some aged Intel. Oh, yeah. yeah that's 2016. That's a little yeah, that's probably long. Yeah. It's probably long oh, old. Crap. Yeah. Yeah, let's go back here. Uh, let's sort that go. by date. It's one of the things that's frustrating about MISP is uh, sometimes there's some UI features here that uh, open source think, software is always fantastic. <laughs> yeah, you think by default they would uh, they would do. Something. It certainly wasn't user user error. All right, how about this one? Uh, C two with it all from ransomware to carding. That just seems it feels fun, right? So let's take a look at this guy. Uh, all right, notice. Okay, we have the link, and okay, so now this all makes sense. Probably when that 2016 intelligence was published, that was in the early days of MISP. Very likely they didn't support the link uh, type at the, at the minute. Okay, so this one's a little bit more interesting, right? So now we can see some things here uh, that are pretty interesting. We actually have a live link right here if I want to go look and see what Talos says about all of this. And notice this is why it's it's a link type, right? Uh, I can see some host names that are in here. I can actually see that whoever the analyst is has actually referenced this um, to the actual uh, malware campaign. Looks like a tiny POS command and control. Uh, so that's pretty interesting. And I can scroll down and I can see a lot of different things here. Notice there are host level artifacts of things that we might want to look at and then also network level artifacts as well. So see how, how interesting this one's inter <laughs> Mimikatz. See that one often. See, I wonder what they're trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe passwords or something. Yeah, something like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I thought it was a method of view cat videos online. Yes, there we go. Yes. Mimikatz. <laughs> Mimikatz. Meme yes. There you go. <laughs> So what you're looking at here uh, is like literally distilling all of the buzzwording you hear in the world of threat intelligence uh, and all this like, you know, next level, what did you call it? Like AI driven, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Threaty threat uh, stuff. Threaty threat stuff. Um, this is threat intelligence at its purest nature, right? Um, literally analysts 
uh, giving uh, like like help to other analysts saying, hey, here's something we're seeing. We want to share yeah. it out. Anyone can consume it, consume freely, use, share back. This is what intelligence sharing is really all about at its essence. And, and really, I mean, as we look through a lot of these, um, you know, if you dig in further, there's ones that have registry entries. You know, obviously we see file hashes and all kinds of various stuff. So, you know, detecting at different points, you know, are we going to detect on the host? Are we going to detect on the network? Uh, you know, how do we detect these things? And, you know, uh, kind of honestly, the various quality of some of them as well. So here's another one. Uh, we, we have a lot of these we use um, here at work. Uh, but let's take a look at like this Tor node list, right? So just literally a whole bunch of Tor nodes that are constantly being updated, right? So if I have a hit on one of these within my network, I mean, is that red alarm? No, no. probably not. In fact, we see lots of falsing off Tor nodes all the time. Um, the idea of threat intelligence is not to say, you know, hey, I had a hit. I definitely had a breach. I think a lot of times people have that misnomer in their in their head of like, hey, I saw a reference to this in my own organization. Therefore, I must be hit with something. Well, no, not necessarily, right? The whole idea of threat intel sharing is is just to give me a greater visibility and idea of things that are happening. Um, maybe if I see some Tor node activity alongside a couple other threats and alerts that have been seen, maybe now I should worry, yeah. right? Um, but a single kind of piece by itself may not be a big issue. Riggs, you want to kind of explain like some examples of where like you might see a Tor node hit in your network, but it's not actually Tor traffic? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we actually saw this probably about 12 months ago. Uh, we, we started getting a lot of alerts around uh, Tor exit nodes. Um, and one of the really interesting things is uh, we saw it on port 123. Um, if you know uh, your your ports, uh, it's it's NTP, it's Network Time Protocol, right? And so if we take a look at, uh, at, at the traffic that was coming through, it was actually legitimate clients uh, updating their time because the NTP pool uh, had actually taken on some some legitimate Tor exit nodes as well, and so they were firing based on IP intelligence, even though it wasn't a, a port or any activity that was actually actively assigned or or, or associated with Tor. Um, but it it, it it sure as that created a whole boatload of noise, right? Um, and so that that was that was a lot of fun and. Uh, you know, uh, rearranging the deck, uh, the deck chairs for for a lot of that noise is uh, is is always kind of an interesting thing, and that's one of the uh, the the fun parts of using threat intelligence as well uh, in in these things. You know, understanding uh, the uh, the the uh, the landscape of of what you're looking at. You know, is this sure it's a Tor exit node? But okay, maybe I'm pulling in TP, and that's totally legitimate. Well, I mean, it's part of a legitimate pool, and so that that may be cool. But, uh, yeah, uh, actually having to dig in and take a look at that and, you know, false a lot of, uh, a lot of traffic. I mean, it's so interesting because you kind of have to be like, I mean, you do have to be like an analyst because you're not, you're not reacting on solid information. You're, the idea here is to gather the information and correlate data. And only when you have multiple different correlating points to indicate a breach is when you possibly or potentially need to do something about it. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and, and think about it uh, to your point, I Mindy. Mean, you think about this like a military concept, right? So right. we have all this intelligence, all the satellite imagery showing potential troop movements. Uh, does that mean an attack is impending? Well, maybe, maybe not. Like a great example of that would be looking at D-Day. You know, all the fainting that the that the Allies did, uh, Axis kind of taking action and thinking and, and trying to figure those things out, right? Like great example of. Uh, we have so much, like, when you when you really start diving into threat intel, it's awesome because of all the visibility you get, but then you quickly get swamped into, well, what do I do with all of this? And how do I, what, what's real, what's not, what do I care about, what do I respond to, what do I not? And it can be overwhelming for sure, which is one of the problems that we have in intel sharing today is, like, typically, you know, the way, if you look at, like, a Bank of America, a, like a J.P. Morgan Chase, um, or a super large healthcare org, you know, the way that they do threat intel sharing, detection, response around all of this, they literally have 50 or more threat analysts running around the clock that are doing all of this because they've got the time and the budget, uh, whereas the rest of us don't. Uh, and that's really where part of the broken piece of this system has come from is we have a lot of the automation, we have a lot of the standards that drive this, uh, but we still have some broken processes that don't scale down to everybody else, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's also interesting, like, um, I, I personally am very into physical personal security. Um, and there's so many parallels that can be drawn between, uh, you know, cybersecurity and personal security. So 
like even physically, when you're protecting your house, right? So they talk about uh, you want to have layered defenses. You want to make yourself uh, not too much of a valuable target. You want to make yourself not the easiest target, not the wor- not the hardest target. Um, you kind of want to blend in. Um, make sure that you always have an exit strategy, uh, some way for you to recover or get back into you know some kind of. And it's just they're all the parallels you can draw in with cybersecurity. You, you have to have layered firewalls. Your antivirus running, you know, don't lock yourself out of your system with encryption. Make sure you have your backup key somewhere. Um, it's just, and and it's the same thing with sharing intelligence in your neighborhood. You know, if you know about crime going on in your neighborhood, that's where that's where the threat intel is coming from. Um, it's it's all the same thing. You just have to apply it different ways. But it's yeah. Well, and I mean, if you've ever been on the Nextdoor app, you know that, you know, physical intel is, is, is absolutely yeah. crap, right? You know, hey, somebody slow rolled down the neighbor, you know, down the uh, down the road, you know, what's going on here? And really, it was actually just somebody looking for a house number that they're supposed to be at, right? Right, um, exactly. And, and the natural assumption is, is, hey, this is shady. Um, but, I mean, to your point, you know, I mean, it's the uh, it's the fifth domain of warfare, cyber is. Um, you know, I mean, you have, have land, sea, air, airspace, and now... Um, um, cyber, uh, in that it's, um, it's one of those, those things that, you know, um, it, it seems like this complex abstract concept until you're like, no, I mean, it really is just a new domain that we're, 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 we're fighting on. And in the, in the end, the enemies aren't necessarily traditional either. I mean, you know, we, we don't go around in America having to worry about car bombs all the time. Right. Um, and yet here we are getting ransomed, uh, you know, every day of the week. And, and so it's, it's somewhat of a foreign concept, uh, to, to most people. And, uh, the, the whole physical security thing, uh, I think draws a, a really, really nice parallel, uh, to that. So, yeah. All right, right on. So let, we're going to come back to MISP uh, a lot more here in a minute. But uh, this kind of brings oh, up this idea. I know. I know, right? I, yes, I, I told to, you he wanted it. Back to the PPTs. <laughs> I know it. Uh, I can't argue with that. <laughs> I like PowerPoint. All right, so let's talk about ISACs and ISAOs for a minute, right? So TSP, ISAO, we mentioned, ConnectWise is kind of spinning it up. Um, so th- w- the whole idea of these groups is, you know, this idea of sharing threats based upon a commonality. And and it makes sense, right? Like a bank is probably very concerned with, like, banking Trojans with, um, like, uh, what's the what's the physical ATM jacking, uh, jackpotting? Is that what the yeah, banks yeah, call jackpotting. it? jackpotting. Like yeah. jackpotting, you know, like those are, like, the kind of threats that a bank cares about. They care a lot less about... Um, you know, some kind of IoT Mirai based botnet that's hitting like your heart pump valves uh, or heart pump monitors or whatever at a hospital, right? Not that they don't care at all about it, but the scope of that's a lot less for a bank, right? And so the idea of banks joining together saying, I care about what's going on in the financial services yep. sector makes a lot of sense, right? Same with healthcare, same with water utilities, electric utilities, same with, you know, you name it. Um, there's a lot of value in that. Not to say that we shouldn't band together with what's going on, you know, with others, but the idea of an ISAC or an ISAO is sharing based upon some kind of relatability, right? And so I'm not going to go, you can see all this stuff that's here, but this, this is the idea, right? Is being able to kind of join together and share based upon a, a, a peer group, right? So at this point, like we talked a lot about um, what intelligence looks like. We've talked about, you know, that we do have some problems. But one of the things we haven't really talked about is like how intelligence can be made um, uh, good uh, and how intelligence is actually shared, right? And so like that's the big thing that we wanted to talk about a lot more today is one of the awesome things about intelligence is um, it is, so we've finally driven this into standards, right? And if you think about standards for a minute, like the world of IT, we've been good at standards for like, decades (laughs) decades <laughs> let me give you some examples right like uh for the most part if i go to a website uh, i know that there are some minor differences but whether i use chrome or firefox or whatever i'm gonna be able to visit a a website and get a relatively unique experience to somebody else and why is that well that's because we've driven standards to to uh, unify that experience, right? Like HTTP, uh, there's probably applications that run on top of HTTP, right? Like CSS or like, uh, I don't know, like some kind of front-end framework like um, uh, uh, GraphQL React. or React or something like that. And then you go down the stack, right? And you start getting into things like uh, um, uh, TCP, right? And IP below all of that, right? We standardized all of that. Um, in the world of security, by and large, we suck at standards. Yeah. Uh, we really kind of navigate to proprietary like magic that you know one organization does 
compared to another. And not only does that cause problems, but when we don't have standardization, we don't get unification around, um, you know, a, a continuity of what we're trying to do here. And and Threat Intel has actually struggled with that for a really long time. I've watched Threat Intel standards kind of get pushed and try, you know, to hit the market, and they fall apart for various reasons. But finally, we've kind of unified around some standards, which are like sticks and taxi. And we're going to jump into some of that and show you guys some sticks and taxi here in a minute. But does that kind of make sense so far? Yeah. Yes. All right, cool. So before I jump into sticks and taxi, let me show you um, what I call the, the holy scripture of threat intelligence. Uh, we forgot to load this. Oh, so yeah. I'm just going to have to go searchify it. Look uh, at that. Uh, he he was able to type the Google's knows. a whole bunch of people. The Google's knows. All right. So first of all, before I click it, you guys see what year this is? <laughs> a little old. Threat intelligence. This is, this is insanely old, right? This is like reading the holy scriptures of whatever your religion may be, right? Like, it's unbelievable that this guy wrote this article... Uh, and I can't click, so Riggs is going to click it for me. Uh, it's unbelievable. It's this guy bourbon. wrote this article uh, so long ago, 2013, and it, it holds true today. So I'm not going to read this. You guys can literally go and figure this out and read it on your on your own. But a couple things I want to talk about. So this guy created this idea of like, hey, when we talk about threat intelligence and we talk about what we really need to do versus what we are doing, we have a major problem. And it dumbfounds me that here I am today, tw the end of 2019, and the same problem problem that he foresaw in 2013 is the same problem that we're still in today. And here's this idea. Let me walk you through it. So you look at this pyramid right here. In fact, let me just zoom in a little bit so we can see it a little bit more. So here's this idea. Start at the bottom of the pyramid. Look at things like hashes. And as you walk up, IPs, domains, uh, uh, like host and network artifacts, tools, and TTPs, right? The idea is this. It's really, really easy for me as a good guy to be able to detect and see the things that are lower on the pyramids to actually say, hey, I'm seeing this as an example. Like legacy AV is a great example for decades has been doing hash-based detections for a really long time, right? And why is that? Well, because of the nature of a hash, right? I hash some kind of file. Uh, I have a one-way representation of that from here to forever after, right? So it's really great. Uh, same with IPs, right? Really easy. Every firewall can emit some kind of log that looks at IPs. Every firewall can block based on IPs. Most firewalls can do some kind of DNS. So you see what we're doing is we're stepping up the stack. It's really easy for us to see those things. It's easy for us to detect those things, and it's easy for us to share those things, right? That's obvious. But here's, here's the rub. For a bad guy, it's equally the same. So if I'm a bad guy, how easy do you think it is for me to re recrypt my malware and change the file hash? Take seconds. How easy do you think it is for me if I own a botnet or I own some kind of C2 infrastructure to switch from one IP to the next? Let's burn a host. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we just talked about DGAs earlier. Bad guys have been doing G DGAs for a decade now, right? Uh, literally uh, changing those domains that I'm calling back to all the time, right? Yep. And, so, well, and, and the cool thing about DGAs or the interesting thing, I guess, about DGAs is they're algorithm algorithmically predictable. Um, and so the bad guys, you know, rehash executable that's sit, uh, sitting on the host is out looking at, you know, predictable domain names that we may not be able to know uh, offhand. It's, it's, it's really interesting. All right. <clears throat> So here's what we're saying with those three on the bottom of the period. I'm not saying dump those things, right? I'm not saying don't detect and respond on those things. I mean, you should for sure. Um, but it's easy for us to do those things. And a bad guy's happy, very happy to let us operate in that domain, that territory, because he's going to say the same thing, which is fine. If you want to detect on IPs and domains and, and hashes, I'll just rehash or I'll just recrypt. I'll just switch IPs. I'll just switch domains. Happily, happily, happily. If we really want to start pushing pain back onto a bad guy, we've got to step up this pyramid of pain, right? And so the idea behind this is saying it's great to detect on those things, but if we really want to make it harder, we've got to make it harder on ourselves first. Yep. And so this idea of like, what if I could start doing some things at the host level? What if I understand what the host is doing? What if I understand new services that are being spun up? What if I understand um, how this malware likes to call out uh, over the network? Like an actual signature of like how, not, I don't care where it's going to, I care about a particular flag that it always uses or a particular mechanism that it always has contained inside of that that it shares out. Now that's harder for us to do because as an analyst, I have to dive in a lot deeper. 
I have to research a lot more. But when I do that, now I don't care. The bad guy can switch his DGAs a thousand times and I'll catch it a thousand times, right? And so while it takes a lot more work for us to do, guess what? It makes it a lot more difficult for the bad guy. Let's go up a little bit higher and start getting into tools and TTPs. So if you scroll down a little bit in this article, you'll see this, right? So you see tools here and you see TTPs or uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures. The idea here, and there's a lot of, in my opinion, Riggs, I don't know what you think about this, but in my opinion, when you start talking about tools and TTPs, it's really kind of a lot of the same thing. But what we're talking about here is what is that actual, like, what's the bad guy doing? Like, for example, taking um, uh, Soden and the Soden-based attacks, right, and the Revil actor. Uh, what are they doing? Who are they targeting? How are they targeting it? What does that malware particularly look like? Uh, where are they operating out of? What jurisdictions are they in? Like when we start really stepping into understanding our bad guy and what they're doing, now we begin to understand our enemy a whole lot more. And now if we can start attacking them at that point, now we're starting to cut the, the, the head off yeah. of the snake. Well, when we start looking and addressing TTPs and tools, um, <clears throat> you know, we start talking a lot of defense in depth. Not only are we talking about, you know, host-based controls, you know, hey, let's, uh, let's not let people open up executables and email attachments or, you know, let's not let zip files through or whatever we we happen to be doing um you know uh let's not let screensaver files through because all they are, are renamed executables those types of, of fun things but then also how are they delivering these things are they maybe delivering them in a password protected pdf that then has a link to the download and you know what how are they actually trying to gain access into our network and what are they using to gain those footholds and that's where really um you know, if we can start to address through a defense in depth uh, uh, um, uh, uh, methodology, uh, we can actually start, you know, lowering their, their success rate beyond just, hey, let's block IPs, hey, let's block domains, right? Um, you know, when we start actually going at the core of the things that they're doing with methodical controls and, and uh, you know, great ways of, of implementing good security standards, that's when we actually really start uh, inflicting real pain on them. That anyway. makes sense so far? Yeah. So let me let me flip back for a minute. Let's talk about the TSPI cell, right? So uh, I hope and I believe that the TSPI cell is going to get a whole lot of members. I think they grew like they, the, I think the first year membership is free or whatever that they're doing. Um, this it's great. Uh, one of the things that's going to make the TSPI South successful, and I'm just telling you this. So one of the things Riggs and I didn't talk about is both of us uh, before coming to Perch, I did first and then he did second. Both of us had um, some opportunities inside of uh, financial services ISAC. So the FS ISAC inside of banks, that is the biggest ISAC in the world. There's about 7,000 members um, from the largest of banks around the world all the way down to tiny little credit unions, right? Uh, one of the things that he and I both, both learned is if the members are not driving the ISAC, the ISAC will fail. Yep. If the members are not dictating how the ISAC should share intelligence and serve its members, then the ISAC won't do what its core responsibility is, which is sharing and delivering threat intelligence information down to the hands of the members, right? And so one of the things I wanted to be like super clear with is that um, ConnectWise doesn't own uh, the TSPI SAO. You guys as the members own them. The vendors like Perch and others, we don't own the ISAO. You guys own the ISAO. And so in order for this to be effective, one of the things you guys have got to demand is, hey, we if we're going to be a member of this and we're going to actually get actionable intelligence out of this, it needs to be something we can do something with. So we want to make sure that you guys aren't sharing junk out for us that we can't do anything with that's causing us noise. Uh, we want, just like this TTP pyramid of pain, we want you guys focusing on the top of the pyramid as much as you possibly can. We want you and we expect you to work with the federal government, uh, with other threat researchers around the world, with vendors, with whatever it takes to truly understand who our adversary is, how they're operating, where they're operating, so that we can really, truly start doing the things we need to do to protect ourselves, right? And so I wanted to say that because I think that's critical in order for you guys to have success as TSPs, as you're now called, um, in, in truly kind of forming an effective ISAO. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, what you're saying is basically, I mean, the community makes up how effective you actually are. And it's, I mean, it's true for any community, honestly. If, if we're not, if we don't get the right stuff, then then it's going to be useless to us. And if we don't demand the right stuff, then it's gonna, we're not going to get it, and then it's just going to fail. 
Well, exactly. I mean, why why is MSP Geek so so successful? Is it uh, is is it because it's driven by a vendor or you know driven by a single interest that says, no. hey, this this is going to be excellent? Absolutely not. I mean, it's yeah. it's driven by a bunch of people who want to uh, I mean, want to troll you Martin, on Martin's on Slack. Not on this cast, but I'll I'll repeat his words that he likes to bandy around all the time. I mean, we're by the community for the community. I mean, it's the community that made MSP Geek what it is. Yeah. Uh, and that's and it's the same thing that you're talking about for the ISAL. Like they, we have to make sure that as members, we we get the information we need in order for it to be successful. Yeah, well, and you know, one of the interesting things about an ISAL or an ISAC is they get special legal consideration when they're sharing information. Um, sometimes there's information that could be shared that could get your butt in a legal bind. Um, but thanks to some uh, some legislation, what back in 2009, 2014, something like that. Um, you know, actually, uh, it, it, it uh, has, you know, language around safe harbor and things like that to where if me as, as an individual shares a banking account number uh, with an ISAC, guess what? Um, I, I am not, uh, not really necessarily transmitting PII at that point. Um, I am actually uh, transmitting in a protected fashion PII. Uh, that is allowed to be freely shared with other members, and so there's there's some pretty cool legal protections around information sharing that can happen as well. Um, the uh, the uh, legislation I think boiled down to uh, what's it called CISA, I believe. Yeah, uh, CISA. Um, and actually, just to make things even more confusing, there is a a group inside of DHS. It's now called CISA, which is a completely different acronym. So, <laughs> so I have the most important question. Okay. How do I, as a uh, run-of-the-mill managed service provider, utilize this system? Which system? Uh, that, you know, uh, being smarter about uh, you know, MISPs and uh, 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 you know cyber intelligence. How 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 do I, as a regular MSP, take advantage of what is available with this open source software and? all of this information that's being dumped. How, how would I take advantage of that? Okay, I'm glad you asked, because that's one of the, the key takeaways that I think Riggs and I had as we were talking about this. So let's, let's put yourself in the shoes of an everyday uh, I, MSP. Uh, you, you guys have a lot of tickets you got to get through, a lot of customers to make happy. Um, what you don't have time to do and, and the budget to do is hire an Intel analyst or become an Intel analyst yourself. As much as we'd all love to do that, you don't have the ability, right? So part of this requires you to go back to the ISAO and say, guys, we have expectations. We have some thin red lines uh, that we require out of you to make this thing effective and useful, right? And so one of those is I'm showing you MISP because I want you to see like what a threat intel platform is all about. You guys are welcome to spin up a MISP. Um, I don't know. I don't think the TSB ISAO has decided like what platform they're going to use, but MISP is like the most popular uh, one that's out there. And what's awesome about it is it's open source, so it's free for anybody to use. Um, if they go that route, then they will have, you know, I don't know that they'll give you access to it as like a user account. They may, they may not. But none of that really matters. Like, my point is, I want you to see how, and I'm going to show you in a minute, how intelligence is created and how it's shared. I think the first thing that you need to do is you need to go forward and you need to say, we, we are excited about joining this, but we want to lead the direction and the vision and the strategy of this thing. And so one of the things that we want to make sure is that all members can join, all members can share, uh, all members can talk about the threats that they're seeing in whatever format and context that may exist. And so I'll give you some examples, like some really good ISACs and ISAOs that are out there, whether it's like old school email exchanges or it's something much more modern like Slack, have great ways of which they can share threats with one another. And the ISAO should actually be the one that stacks the Intel analyst that say, hey, thank you for sharing that with me. I might need to jump on a phone call or an email to ask you a couple questions, but I'll go through all of the hard work of consuming everything you're telling me is a threat, you know, eliminating the, the noise and false positives out of this, and then taking all of that and producing that into actionable intelligence that can then be shared out with every other member. They are the ones that should take the brunt of all the heavy lifting. They just need you as the community to say, hey, these are the threats we're seeing, and this is what we're worried about, and this is what we need to do. And if you take a look at the business model of any successful ISAC or ISAO, um, you know, uh, it's exactly that. It's membership driven. Uh, they, they, uh, um, they, they don't, they're not self-interested, right? Um, 
it's it's uh, it's not the uh, the desire of the community for that. And so, you know, they're going through their staffing. They're they're doing the hard things that you know, uh, uh, with with you uh, as as the power of one can't do by yourself right it 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 goes back to that herd mentality and you know as wes had had talked about earlier you know turning around to face to face the lion who's hunting you um you know the power is in the numbers and uh you know uh, that's where it 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 really does come down to is uh you know being able to have those those specialized positions there to source that threat intelligence to to help help drive those things and even beyond threat intelligence too right uh isacs and isows do uh all kinds of fantastic things uh one of my favorite things that the the financial services isac did was called an all hazards playbook and it's literally that it covers everything from physical uh disruption natural disaster pandemic uh um you know uh problems you you may have all the way through cybersecurity, right? Um, I mean, it, it literally takes into account, uh, you know, uh, what kind of things you may want to consider if uh, if if a bank branch is leveled, right? Um, all the way to, hey, here's here's what happens if uh, if you have an inadvertent uh, data disclosure. And those are the value adds that you know really make it important, uh, and and go beyond you know kind of the the hashes and IPs and domain names and and helping fight the bad guy and actually build yourself up for resiliency uh, in the very likely event that you know you're targeted by somebody at some point. Okay, um, I'm gonna cut in for a second. And yeah. I'm gonna circle back on a lot of things that you covered. Yes, um, from what. From what it sounds like, I just want to make it clear. A lot, a lot of people when they talk about security, they don't they don't think about what you're what you just mentioned, disaster recovery, which is one of the huge parts about what happens. They don't think about the after effects of a breach. They think about, you know, how do I not get breached? No one thinks about the the end result. No one thinks about what happens in a natural disaster. You know, how do I get back up and running? That's not in considered in most people's definition of security. So I just want to highlight that point because that's a really good point and it's something that I have an argument with all the time with people. Um, that when we talk about security, it's not about securing data from unauthorized people. That is part of it. It's also about securing your stability and reliability as a service provider, um, which includes you know, what to do in the event something happens that interrupts your service. We have to have a plan of action which is part of your security plan in order to maintain uh, your services and stay up and running. And you also have to have uh, a, a final plan of action. Like, yes, ideally you are never breached, but if something does happen, what is your reaction to that? That's also part of your security plan, you know? Um, so that's, that's just something I just wanted to highlight. Cause you, you mentioned a, yeah. uh, the intelligence analysis, which would basically be, you know, how to prevent and stop and look for breaches. Um, and then you covered disaster recovery of a natural disaster occurring. And then you mentioned uh, disclosure of a breach occurring. Um, so those are like three separate different categories, but they're Absolutely. all security. Um, the final, the thing I really want to talk about though was you mentioned the ISO bringing, like taking the bulk of the responsibility in terms of analysis and 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 gathering information and all all we should be doing as a small time uh, run of the mill msp is providing information to the isal and, and then they take up the bulk of the work right as like the herd mentality um the question i have though in from my understanding is that part of the analysis is looking at the actual systems that are internal to you to investigate what's actively happening on those computers, to look at those files, see what's happening, uh, software behavior, network traffic. Um, and unless I'm misunderstanding something, the, the staffing that they're providing that you're saying will be taking the bulk of the work will not necessarily have access to your systems to do that. Correct. And so when you look at, at that, it's how do you effectively share with them the information in a way that is, that's expedient for you? Um, you know, it could be as, uh, something as simple as sharing a phishing email uh, um, that you have, uh, you know, along with the headers, right? 
okay. uh, all the way up to, uh, hey, I have this ransomware dropper. Here's how it came in. Here's here's the the footholds I saw. You know, here's here's the registry run keys. Here's the IPs I saw it communicate with. There's there's various levels that you can do this at. The important thing is is to get into a habit of sharing. Um, and 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 that is is uh, is really I think the you know one of the core key components of that. Um, is, you know, some are going to share more, some are going to share less. There are larger MSPs that are better staffed. There are smaller MSPs that aren't going to even have the time to go through and uh, and do that. You know, some will be pro- uh, producers of, of, of this threat intelligence. Some will be just consumers. It, it, you know, a lot of it really does mirror, you know, a, a lot like the open source community. There are a lot of strong producers out there, and there are far more consumers, but everybody still benefits from it, correct? Um, and, and so when we look at that, um, you know, I think that it, it's, it's a very uh, 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 appropriate question of, you know, at, at what level do we say, hey, time out, enough's enough, this is still way too much work versus, hey, uh, you know, can we actually add something of value to the community? Russ, do you have some thoughts on that? No, I, I think that's perfect. And we're going to talk about going from like a consumer to a producer in just a minute. One of the things, while everything Riggs said is true, I do think um, all it takes is catching the vision a little bit of this to say, hey, I'm going to become a producer too. And maybe my level of producing is quite low. Maybe I only share something, you know, once every other month. Um, and maybe on, like the only thing I share is literally forwarding an email out that says, hey, this is definitely a phishing email. Someone at the TSBI house should take a look and do something with it. That's fine. Right. Um, and I'm going to share a quote with you. One of the most prolific um, threat intelligence producers in the world today is a personal friend of, of Riggs and I. His name's Nathan Fowler. I'm going to show you a quote from him in a minute um, that really kind of speaks to the power of just everyone saying, hey, I'm going to share. Um, we don't all have to share equally, but we do have to have that vision of saying, I do want to share what I see because I never know when that's the, the godsend and the final, the final puzzle piece that somebody else is missing. Yeah, so basically the answer is that, yes, analysis is required on your end, but even if you don't have time to do an analysis, even, for example, sending off the hash or uh, attached file or file name or location or phishing email, any little bit of information allows the analysis externally, the uh, analyzer or, you know, whatever, analyst externally to then uh, research and come up with from other uh, threat intel sources you know, more information that can help the community is what you're saying. Exactly. And we'll show you an example of that here in a second. Exactly right. All right. So before we do that, let me actually show you some sticks. Uh, So sticks to... You mean like off off a tree? (laughs) (laughs) I do not. Oh, okay. All right. So... Uh, so let's see here. We'll just, yeah, this right here. So, um, there's a group called Oasis. Um, they are a uh, nonprofit that owns, well, I guess nobody owns sticks, no. right? Uh, they oversee the standard just like, um, you know, I typically uh, has their standards. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Well, so what it, it is. <laughs> yeah. However, things that people loosely adhere to and make it makes shit broken half the time, right? Exactly. <laughs> Naming you Microsoft, Cisco, Apple. <laughs> All right. So I want to show you some of this, right? So you saw what intelligence looked like in like a graphical format, like how it kind of rests in MISP. But I want to show you actually how it's shared because, again, I think. Uh, I don't think any of you are, are going to need to necessarily write MISP, but when Spooner and I were talking about all this, he's like, no, no, I want to go deep into, like, I want, I want this, this cast to be, you know, pretty technical. And so I want to get technical for a minute. I want to show you how intelligence is actually shared at a machine language, in a machine level. So one of the worst things that we can do, you know, imagine, like, the old days, and again, I keep using World War II because I'm such a big fan of World War II. Imagine, like, the Navajo Wind Talk. Right? Imagine if we had to have like Navajo wind talkers sharing intelligence from company to company, like the old telephone game we play as kids. Right? That would be horrible. Um, so pretty much all cyber intel needs to be shared by machine. There is no need for a person to do that anymore. Just like there's no need for me to have to have someone like transcribe to me what a website should look like or fax it to me. Uh, that's what IP is for, right? And so let's take a look at one of these. So 
um, the, the, the Styx protocol is now at version 2, which is really, really awesome. Uh, Styx 1 had was a great start. And by the way, so just a shout out to our CEO, Aaron Chernin. So Aaron um, was one of the founders. There's three kind of creators of Styx. Um, Aaron is one of those founders. Um, and so this is kind of where our background came from and why we're such you know believers in what Intel sharing can do. And the coolest thing about Styx itself as a protocol is it's now pretty much the adopted standard. Most vendors now support it. Um, pretty much all ISACs now use it to share the intelligence. It's just a way of standardizing so everyone kind of speaks the same language, so to speak. So let me show you an example of this. Here is an indicator for a malicious URL. So they kind of give you like a, a data model, but up here they share with us kind of what um, the scenario looks like. So you can see this right here. So we're seeing a URL, someone saying, hey, this particular URL is known to be malicious. Some kind of backdoor piece of malware is associated. Uh, the site has been shown to host this uh, backdoor malware, blah, 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 right? So this is what we want to share out. We want to make it possible to where anybody can consume this, whether a firewall consumes it, whether some kind of intrusion detection system consumes it. I don't care. I just want to make it possible for us to share, right? And so let me do some zoom ins again. So here's kind of the way this looks. Um, there are a whole bunch of objects that exist within sticks. Um, there are things like indicators. There are like threat actors. There are uh, malware campaigns. There are actually malware labels. There's all kinds of like things that exist, like objects that exist within sticks that we can express and reference and explain. It's really, really rich, which is which is great, right? Um, but what we want to do here is we're trying to share an indicator, right? We're trying to say, hey, this particular URL right here is nasty. We're trying to say when this thing is known to be valid from, and we're trying to attach it to some kind of um, piece of malware um, in some kind of attack behavior. I don't know, are you guys familiar by any chance with like the, is it the Lockheed kill chain and or like the MITRE attack framework? Yeah. Uh, familiar with, uh, like verbally, I've never really dived into it. Okay. No worries. So let me take yet another rabbit trail because this is what we do on this cast, right? So let's just use the cyber kill chain because I think it's a little bit easier to start and then I'll show you the attack framework uh, in a minute too. So uh, yep, there we go. you, you got to love it when someone has made a registered trademark for something like this, which is why it's aggravating. But here's the idea to the kill chain. Like, So Lockheed Martin just sort of wanted to say, hey, look, we just want to kind of express how an attack begins and ends and the entire process through it. So things like starting with the bad guy doing reconnaissance on you, right? And then sort of moving into weaponization of that attack, right? How are they actually, now that they know what you're vulnerable to, what it looks like, how do I weaponize something? How do I deliver that malware to you? Is that going to be through like an email? Um, how do I exploit you? So once I deliver that, how does the exploitation process begin? How do I get uh, malware installed? How do I actually get command and control back so I can now manipulate and do additional things? Um, and then what kind of things can actually happen from there leading all the way into whether it's ransomware or whether it's some kind of like data exfiltration, whatever it may be, right? So just a way of sort of expressing the entire chain of events for the way a, a, an attack goes. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So let's look at uh, – it, it's pretty basic, right? There's nothing like really mind-blowing about it, right? right. So MITRE – is a much better, I'm not going to even try to do the ampersand in there because Google will fix it for me. What did uh, you type? <laughs> what are you <laughs> typing on my machine? I just type things and usually I let Google figure it out for me. It's. <laughs> I'm going to blame bourbon. I mean, don't we all just Google random things? And I hope it's yeah, right. Yeah. 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 We're exacting like he types everything perfectly. Come on now. <laughs> I know he doesn't for a fact. I've got text proof. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should switch this to uh, my... my my spelling is perfect. Yes. Anyways, moving on. All right, so MITRE. Uh, big fan of MITRE. Uh, MITRE is a nonprofit, uh, I don't know, government contractor. They're yeah. different than Lockheed and the rest because they are working at a nonprofit level and they're very focused on like research. Um, they, MITRE is one of the ones that actually kind of led to the creation of sticks and then handed that off to a true like uh, standard agency. Yeah. Um, so MITRE does some really, really cool things. And one of those is expressing how an attack looks and where that particular piece of the attack belongs in the whole story. So when you look at this right here, they actually show the whole thing. And again, we're not going to dive into all of this. Nobody could. Uh, but this idea of initial access, and you'll see kind of it mimicking the, the kill chain. Initial access, execution, persistence, privilege escalation, defense evasion, credential access, discovery, lateral movement, collection, 
command and control, exfiltration, and then what kind of impact it is, right? And so this is a way of describing what I'm seeing and where it may belong. And if you just kind of look through here, there's all kinds of things. And this is sort of like a living, breathing document that's continually updated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, yeah, I mean, if you take a look, like, uh, you know, create account, right? Uh, it's, it's a great method of persistence. Do you need to click on it? No, no, I'm. Oh no, I was just. Hoping Dude, I'm. To, we're gonna click on it. All right, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we do around here. We click things. Yeah. And drink a lot. Yeah, I mean, we got time, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, I mean, if we if we look at the uh, the persistence technique of, of creating an account, right? It's exactly that. Hey, I want to create uh, the, uh, the user account of bad guy because I don't want to be using the administrator account, or I don't want to be using Sue's account because maybe you know she doesn't have a level of privilege I had wanted, uh, and so I needed to create a new a new account to uh, not just not to establish a level of, uh, of privilege I wanted. Um, you know, all the way, I mean, there's, uh, uh, let's see, I mean, there's all kinds of, fun. yeah, man in the browser, that's always a fun one. Um, you know, Drydex was a good one for that, for, for credential theft and, and all that. Yeah, so the whole idea of this is literally just expressing um, pieces of an attack, how it works, um, the kind of the tradecraft that's involved in whatever this may be, um, and then being giving us the capability of expressing it, right? Now, why do and I classifying it. And classifying, yeah. So why do I mention it? Well, I mention it because, wrong link, this is the tab I want, because within sticks, I can actually reference that, which is really awesome. So now I can say, hey, this particular thing that I'm looking at, I want to express exactly where this thing exists. So any analyst can pick this up and say, oh, okay, cool. You're talking about a man in the browser. That's specifically the, the piece of intelligence that you're wanting to share with me, right? Or you're actually sharing with me, this is a spearfish at the very, very beginning, right? Really powerful because it gives me the capability of understanding where this stuff looks. Now, how does it look? How do I actually um, share this out from machine to machine? Well, we all know JSON or JSON, as some people like to call it. Um, so this, what you're looking at, this right here is raw cyber intelligence, right? So you're actually looking at the raw JSON. In the old days, it used to be um, XML, and we finally have wisely oh, moved this God. to JSON, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, by the Sorry. way, a <laughs> uh, little story time. So we'll go to like conferences like RSA, places like that, and uh, you know Aaron's there, our CEO, right? One of the architects of Sticks, and I, I kid you not, like the the super like threat intel dweebs of the world that like put me to shame, they will get selfies with Aaron. They'll be like, "Aren't you Aaron, it's the guy? So like, you're the guy, yeah." And so go up and they'll get selfies with the dude, and then I promise you, the very next thing out of the mouth was, "The hell is wrong with you, son? Why did you do this in XML for Sticks <laughs> One?" And he laughs. And so, by the way, if you guys ever meet Aaron, you need to troll him and be like, hey, wh wh what's up with Six One, dude? What's wrong with you? Now, he will tell you, and rightly so, Jason didn't exist back when Six One was being created. Back in the day. He so has a neck beard. Yes. So, yeah. So, uh, he's got the original Unix beard, right? All that good stuff. Can I uh, send him so links with XML dumps? Please do. He will love it. By the way, his favorite uh, scripting language is Perl. <laughs> 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 and he likes Skyline Chili and Hiccup. Uh, How do we okay. hang out with this guy? I don't know. The man's brilliant, but the man is messed up. Anyways. Hey, then we all have our quirks, right? I mean... We do. Preferences. Yes. Preferences. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here we go. So, uh, again, I'm not going to dive into all of this, but notice, really, a lot of this is pretty self-explanatory, right? We see we're expressing here this is a, an indicator, right? We can see when it's created. If it's been modified, I can see some labels. These are like sort of like freeform things. Um, I can give, uh, so now I can see what we're showing here, some kind of malicious site hosting. I can actually see this pattern is critical. This is what the machine is saying. This is exactly what I'm looking for, and we're telling it it's a URL. Here's what that URL is. Um, I can scroll down and here, again, this is kind of what we were talking about before. Um, now we, we're giving some additional information, whether that's like the actual um, MITRE or the, the Lockheed kill chain or the MITRE attack framework. I'm now kind of referencing that back so I understand what this thing is all about. So all this kind of click. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually uh, really cool. Can you go back to the MITRE attack page for a second? Yeah. Oh, God. We'll so what, 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 we're seeing, what we're seeing here is basically different... Uh, I don't know if you want to call them security boundaries or potential points of prevention um, where a breach occurs in each different phase, right? First, they breach, they get initial access, but then they have the ability to execute. After they're executing, doesn't mean they can execute again, right? They have to maintain the ability to execute over and over and over again. They have to, they have to create a persistence mechanism. Um, 
So that could be simple as like like you, like you mentioned, creating a user account. So that way they can get back in with their own credentials because uh, some user left their computer unlocked. doesn't mean it's going to be unlocked again later on, right? Um, or such as like installing a service that runs by itself, um, which then leads them to privilege escalation so that they can do more things than whatever security uh, security uh, um, token they, they have rights to already. Yeah. Um, and then they have to avoid antivirus and anything running on there. Like the, the whole process is each thing is another step in uh, uh, like layered security, right? We talked about it's another step uh, beyond the next layer. Um, and it's exactly. just really, it's really cool how it all, I mean, if you think about it, it's all common sense once you understand yeah. security. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So well said. Yeah. Well, I mean, if we look all, all the way over to the impact column, right, uh, let's look at data encrypted for impact. You want to talk about driving a point home with managed service providers, right? Uh, what's what's the number one fear right now? Uh, ransomware. You know, ransomware. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so that's the impact of, of, of whatever, how they gained a foothold, how they got in, how they decided to spread it laterally, you know, whatever they, they decided to do. And actually... I'm I'm curious on the uh, if, if there's anything about RMM in in any of those columns because uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's probably something that definitely was not uh, uh, thought of initially. Yeah, um, but you know should probably be. I mean, it would probably be somewhere around like lateral movement or discovery. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, uh, I mean, you want to talk about a fantastic software distribution system, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, so if we're talking about defense here and, and what to do and how to plan for something, like going back to that main page would be your blueprint, you know, uh, consider each domain as a potential failure domain and what to do in each situation. What happens if initial access is compromised? How do you detect that? Okay, yes, someone got past A, now how do you stop execution? Right? You mean external remote services like, I don't know, RDP exposed <laughs> RDP to people, access, right? yeah. exactly. Yeah. VPNs that are open with 1234 is the password or, you know, anything like that. Yes, exactly. Um, I mean, there was actually just a, uh, a new CVE, what was that, last week, week before, uh, with uh, a popular firewall vendor. I won't throw anybody under the bus, but they had hard-coded credentials. Um, <laughs> And, and so, um, you know, when you start looking at, all right, how, how do I do this? Um, you know, it, it literally walks you through where you should, you know, assign, uh, you know, some, some, uh, some eyes and, you know, maybe exercise a little defense in depth. Right. So now you guys understand why I have like a miter attack tramp stamp. <clears throat> <laughs> That's a massive tramp stamp. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm such a fan of miter attacks. What was the impact of that exactly? Uh, 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 we roast them, and, and, and I mean incessantly. It's, yeah. <laughs> I can't. But one of our developers actually has a big old uh, Python tattoo on his leg. In fact, yeah. when we were hiring him, he's like, "Yeah, man, I'm all about Python." He pulled up his uh, his uh, pant leg. We're like, yeah, didn't, "Wow!" Didn't yeah. they change? <laughs> they did change the logo. So uh, he's old school now. <laughs> yeah, I'll say so, it now. But, Python's better than PowerShell. Yeah. <laughs> Preach it. So the reason I'm a big fan of, that of Python, Gavin Stone, the <laughs> the admin Gavin Stone. So now you see why attack is so awesome because they really demystify the entire attack process, right? Like vendors are really bad, and hear me, I'm a vendor. We're really bad about talking about threaty threats and all this scary stuff. And you know, at the end of the day, this is what you're looking at right here. And I just think it's so awesome to be able yeah. to sort of really demystify all of this and really understand how this this process yeah. happens. Now, as as a full on security practitioner and former CISO, I mean, you're you're the cool CISO now, but um, you know. The attack framework really does encompass the technology really well. Um, you know, the things it doesn't encompass, it, you know, we, we need to talk equally about our people and process. You know, uh, what, what processes and procedures do we have in place for ensuring a secure environment? What are we doing to secure the human and all those other things? The attack framework and, and some of those things don't necessarily address that. Uh, they, they, they focus a lot on the technology, but, you know, that's, that's me getting on a soapbox and saying, look, focus on all three, damn it. Um, so just just to just to you know harp on this security stuff, um, take a look at how your business operates. Um, the the end goal is to have your techs uh, you know get into your systems, fix problems that your clients are having, 
and do that as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Some businesses have terminal servers, RDP access. Some have internet access straight to the systems. Some even have ports open that they shouldn't open. So it's uh, you have to look internally on how you access and how every single person accesses your systems from active directory management to, you know, managing automate or manage um, before, you know, and, and look at how they do that and how they get in to look for potential issues. Um, you know, it's, it's surprising how often, well, you know, we used to use terminal servers to get in and, you know, manage our stuff for our remote workers. Um, but we don't do that anymore. Everything's web-based, but the terminal servers are still running. Yep. Um, so, I mean, a, a good a good way to think about that, actually, is it, going back to the parallels being drawn with physical security and stuff like that. Um, what, at a seminar that I was at for physical security, the guy was talking about, he's like, listen, when you leave your house and you forget your key inside the house and you lock the door, any method you can think of to get back into that house is going to be a method that someone who's not supposed to be getting in is going to try to use as well. And we can apply that to basically the same thing that Kyle's saying right now. Anything that you can potentially use to break into the network, any method of access that you have, if you forget your password, any way that you can recover that password is going to be something that's going to be exploited and found by someone else, and you don't want to find that. Oh, exactly. So well, you should, it, uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I'm just saying like that's something that you want to, you want to look about, think about, and, and come up with a list of to try to button down and, and prevent from happening. Oh, absolutely. And, and I think that's why, you know, credential stuffing, uh, phishing, all those things. Uh, uh, so for those that aren't familiar with credential stuffing, it's taking uh, a, a credential that was previously disclosed. Um, so, hey, uh, you know, I went through and landed at that fake Microsoft sign-on page, right? Um, and I, I typed in my password because I, it's the link I clicked. <laughs> Um, well, you know, at some point that that password was stored somewhere and odds are because people are lazy, uh, they use that password elsewhere for other services. Hey, maybe that's my Facebook password. Maybe that's my VPN right. password, whatever it happens to be, you know, FIDO123 ha is, is, is now the keys to the kingdom, uh, in that case. And so when we look at, uh, at that, it's, um, you know, all of a sudden, I, I mean, when you draw your parallel against, you know, how are you going to get back into your house? Well, I mean, it, you, you're right. I mean, that's why credential stuffing is, 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 is so valid. Hey, did I key all my locks the same? Because, hey, look, I found this really cool key on the sidewalk. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, to, to give real credence to this, um, think about, you know, going back to, okay, I got fished. Uh, you know, I typed in my password, my password's reset. Um, but you know, I am one of those people who use my passwords everywhere else. It's the same always. So have your tech, you know, imagine your technician doing that. Exactly. I mean, automate is not a desynced. It's not, there's, there's no uh, LDAP. Uh, it's, excuse me. There's LDAP integration, it is. but it's really You bad. don't recommend to use it. <laughs> I don't recommend anyone touch it with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> but so, but, but so I have my password now. And they use this tool that's not uh, AD integrated, so or potentially not AD integrated at least. Um, so, you know, I now have access to this other system, which could theoretically get me into other systems, and it's you know rolling downhill. Maybe I can reset the password from this one system without having to log into the other system. Maybe they get escalated well, credentials. Yeah. You know exactly. Well, and and then that gets into uh, you know lateral movement and privilege escalation, right? Hey, cool! Right. I, I I found this one thing that wasn't uh, you know Active Directory capable or LDAP capable, uh, but I was able to escalate myself to something that is. Anyways, and we all know we don't want anyone who's not authorized to be in our remote management systems to be in our remote yeah. management systems. I Very mean, easy. I don't personally mind as long as they do my work. <laughs> yeah, just just close my tickets for me, would you? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Here, I'll give you a login to this one. It'll work. Just go in and close and put some time in. Come on now. I need some. Yeah. Yeah, I, stuff I mean, to if do. you actually resolve some issues, cool. Have at it. All right. So one other thing I wanted to show is sticks. Uh, is So think about this for a minute. If we get machines to start expressing threats, uh, what else can those machines do? Well, one of the things we can have machines do is 
tell us if others in our peer groups have seen the same threats that we're seeing, right? Uh, or if I produce a threat, I might want to know, hey, are others seeing the same thing that I'm that I'm sharing out, right? How valuable would that be? Like telemetry, it's like radar, right? Like I cast that out there, what pings back, right? And so this is what what's called sighting. So take a look at this. Really cool example. So, uh, for example, let's take a look at this malicious URL right here. So very similar to the last example. So this one is some, you know, so you can see it's purposely misspelled some PayPal, but with a one dot banking dot com, right? So we know this is a fish. We know this is malicious, right? And so this um, alpha group right here, whoever they are, they're saying, hey, we're, we saw this particular thing. We, we created this indicator. Then what happens is that gets shared out to the threat groups, right? And everybody consumes it that's a peer in that group. And it just so happens that beta group over here saw this particular indicator. So they grabbed that indicator. They saw it. They detected it. And what they can do, and really it's not they, it's the machines. The machines can actually send back out what's called a sighting. So a sighting is a way of expressing, saying, hey, this particular indicator right here, my organization saw it. Here's when we saw it. We saw it one time. Uh, this is the actual indicator that we saw. Uh, imagine when we start doing these kind of things, now we're starting to do like what the herd is doing, right? Now I understand I'm sharing indicators. In other words, I'm saying, hey, here's where the predator is. He's running. And now a whole bunch of other predators are seeing, or a, a prey are seeing the same predator, the same movement. Now I understand, whoa, there's a lot of sightings on this. There's a lot of things that are mm -hmm. happening here. Um, now I can start taking some more evasive action or at least have better intelligence of, I'm not the only one alone here that's seen this particular thing. Yeah. Now, one of the fun things that we've been working on, too, uh, in addition to sightings, there's there's actually some some new objects coming out, uh, some, some, uh, some fixed definition objects coming out. Uh, one of my favorite is the, uh, the opinion object, uh, something that's totally subjective. Um, and so what if you could start bringing in uh, analyst opinion on is this good? Is it bad? Uh, do we agree with it? Do we disagree with it? Um, and uh, make notes around that. Um, all of a sudden, you start bringing in a very subjective human element to it as, as well, and, and you can start making decisions on it too. So, hey, you know, maybe in this one uh, in in this one instance of malware, Google DNS is absolutely malicious, but, you know, and in, in all the, uh, the things we usually see, yeah, so Wes has it up here on the screen, so, you know, everything from uh, agree, uh, strongly agree to strongly disagree, um, and, uh, you know, how do, we, how do we use that? Because then all of a sudden we can start validating. Uh, based on real human input, whether or not this is a, a good or bad piece of intelligence as well. Do I agree with this? Do I disagree with this as, as an Intel analyst? Hey, I got to throw this out there. Uh, who is the neckbeard that's uh, helping sponsor this thing? Shut up. <laughs> so shout out to Riggs. Riggs actually serves on the Oasis committee, uh, and he is one of the ones that's sponsoring this right here. Oh, so. <laughs> can, you, can you change the way those arrows were on the, on the other screen? Because that was, uh, that was uh, hurting my OCD. Uh, no, no. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I'm cool with it just because it, it, it pains you. Um, <laughs> I know where you live, approximately. <laughs> it's all right. You can come. I'll, I'll, I'll share a beer with you. Uh, I, would, I would have one. Yeah. All right. So, you guys ready to jump into, we got, uh, I don't know, a little over 30 minutes left. You guys ready to jump into a practical example? What's um, slide number? Are we on? One, so we have like one thing first. Slides. We don't need no slides. One thing first. If you go back to that to that diagram with the arrows, and this is not just to hurt Kyle. This is also <laughs> to point something out. <laughs> diagram with arrows? Are we talking about? It was. Uh, 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 go back. Oh, I know what you're yeah. talking about. You're talking about. Let me go. Yeah, way go back. keep going back into the waybacks. You're making me go back in time. This. Where are you? Yeah. So if you notice, like we're talking about the sightings and the counts and how many people are seeing it, right? Because you're talking about a large amount of intelligence being gathered by everybody in the community, so to speak. Yeah. Um, one of the cool things, I don't know, it wasn't really pointed out, but if you look at the sectors of the identity, right? So you can actually pinpoint which verticals are seeing which threats. Yes. So uh, which will find... help. Go ahead ever signed up for perch um and this is not a plug whatsoever but it, i mean if you signed up uh did you ever notice how we asked you what industries you belong to yes yeah uh, i know and that's where i that's why i saw that and i was actually gonna draw that to perch 
I was going to plug it for you. You didn't have to do it yourself, man. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Hey, blew hey, it, Riggs. Only Sorry, blew it. Dang, dang it. Dang it. <laughs> I'm the only one allowed to plug things. You should probably buy Perch Security. It's really nice. Um, I'm just going to go jump in the pool that's behind right now. I expect my check in the mail. <laughs> but basically, I mean, for MSPs that have multiple vertical types, right, this is very helpful, especially, and as, as it was mentioned, Perch does this for you if you classify the customer into the correct vertical. Um, where they will pay attention to threats or threats being reported on those specific customers will be classified as healthcare or banking threats um, that will help everybody else. It's just, it, it's more information is better. I always say, like, knowledge is power, you know? So Amen. this is definitely something that's going to help you. Yeah. Well, and, you know, kind of the cool thing about that is, you know, all of a sudden we can have, you know, multiple multiple sightings from multiple verticals, multiple customers, all associated with the same indicator, um, you know, kind of that, you know, hey, you know, plus one type of thing where, you know, we all all love to do a mailing list, be like, hey, uh, have this, yeah, plus one, plus one, plus one. It's like, this. <laughs> but, you know, if we can automate that, it's like, oh, look, we saw 37 million hits of this. <laughs> it would be problematic. Who knows? Maybe. So, anyways, moving on. All right, so let's jump. Let's uh, let's do something here for a minute. All right, so let's go back into MISP, and uh, we're going to do a couple things. So first of all, might need to log in. All right, so a couple things here. Um, I'm going to enable a few things. One of the things I want to enable, and I think I've already done it, but where are my? Uh, here we go. Input filters. Uh, warning lists. So one of the cool things about MISP is it gives me the ability to say, hey, something I'm about to create is not good. And the reason it's not good is because it's a potential false positive. And the reason it's a potential false positive is because one of the, the pieces you're trying to share in this intelligence document uh, belongs to something that's known to be okay. In other words, maybe a CDN. Or I can't tell you how many... Okay, here, great example. Great. I got to share this one. So we're both bankers in the olden days. You guys remember this whole thing about Russia and the election hacking and all this stuff, right? Okay. What are you Fake talking news. about? Fake news. Yeah. Fake news. <laughs> so we called this thing, we called this attack Fancy Bear, right? Wasn't yep. it Fancy yeah, Bear? Yeah, Fancy, Fancy Bear. Bear. Yes. Oh, Fancy that was Bear. the worst piece. Oh, my God. You can do some Googling on Fancy Bear. So because we were in FS ISAC, uh, one of the things that you get as part of financial services ISAC, which is considered a critical um, industry, is you get early access into some of the intelligence the federal government creates. In other words, before the FBI even shares it out through InfraGuard, which is a vetted community, uh, FS ISAC gets it first. So I will never forget the day oh that I get the indicators shared about Fancy Bear back in the early days of, hey, this whole Russia thing may have happened. And they share all these indicators because apparently back then, uh, I guess Russia was hacking her buddy, right? So we get these indicators. I get the big list and I start searching and correlating. It's like way pre-perch days, right? And I start correlating in the sim and come to find out I don't have one. I don't have two. I have thousands yes, of hits it was such all a through my fire. network Yes, of Fancy Bear. And I'm like... Holy bleeping balls, Batman. What are we going to do? We've been hit all by the Russias. Like, really, really, like, this is unbelievable. So we start digging in. My analyst starts digging into this. And we come to find out, not most, every single hit that we had in our network were things like Twitter IPs. And uh, Microsoft.com. Yes, Yahoo yeah. and Microsoft domains. And we're, like, shaking our head, like, what idiot analyst at the Department of Homeland Security produced this intelligence with all these bad indicators? unbelievable right really really so i'll never forget that example it was the first time i thought all hell broke loose and then finally i have this sigh of relief of oh okay just some analysts that should have been fired right well why did that happen here's why it happened if you look at the way a lot of malware um behaves a lot of times they do very legitimate things i've seen malware that one of the first things it does is it calls out to twitter just to say hey am i online and if i'm online then i'm going to do some things if i'm not online i'm going to wait uh, great example. And so when we reverse malware, sometimes we take everything that we saw in it and we see some benign things and we say, hey, this is a particular piece of what this malware is doing, therefore it's bad. Well, not always, right? Um, and so warning lists 
are a great way of a whole bunch of like whitelists to say, hey, if you see a match for one of these, chances are you should remove it so you don't piss a whole bunch of people off when you produce this intelligence. Right Now, again, these are things that um, somebody should be doing for you within the TSPI cell, but I just wanted to show that. So I've enabled a whole crap ton of them. I literally have probably 100,000 uh, maybe or so, at least many tens of thousands of different whitelists coming into my miss Benson. So these are all kinds of things that may alert me of something, right? So let's start here for a minute. Um, where should we start, Riggs? Why don't we start um, here? Yeah, so yeah, just go ahead and reload that. You guys quick. use? Do you guys use URL scan? Have you ever uh, heard of it? Seen it? Used it? I've never heard of it, but I'm. Oh, I've <laughs> seen it before. I think on a Huntress cast they showed it. I believe oh, they were looking cool. for like a fishing site for 365. <laughs> <laughs> and they found it. <laughs> That's exactly what we're going to do. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> search. All right, so we're going to search, and we're going to do exactly what Kyle and team did. <laughs> well, it, it's it's nice to know there's nothing original in, uh, in, in this either, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so some of them you can tell right here are probably not malicious, but you can scroll and find ones like this one probably doesn't look too legit. What do you think, Riggs? Uh, click it. Let's see. Let's find out. Let's yeah. just take a look at it. I'm having a sense of data. Over. This one's offline. Let's find uh, one that's currently on. So, by the way, what we're doing here, um, you can actually submit any URL that, that you one. get. This one here? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, and look, look, there's an email address in it. <laughs> we're accidentally doxing someone on this, but that's their fault for including it. Poor Allison, too. <laughs> <laughs> and it's an oh, no, it's, it's, Re so it's Resimac. Yeah. <laughs> I was about to say it's a Mac user with an Office 365 login. It's like it's like virus total. Like sometimes I'm blown away by the stuff that people submit. I'm like, do you realize what you're? Uh, okay, anyway, whatever. Moving on. Uh, Okay, so here's what we see. A lot of information around all of this. We can see the URL. Um, sometimes some of these will actually redirect somewhere else. So, like, here's an example one we were looking at earlier. Here's the submitted URL, but it actually refers somewhere else. And, by the way, um, so sometimes bad guys do things like this. You guys know what this is right here? Uh, base 64 encoded tree. Yeah. You're a smart man. Not base 65. We're not there yet. Uh, but yeah, there's, so. There's still only 64 bases. <laughs> <laughs> I thought there were only four. Oh, uh, okay. I give doing? up. I give up on your copy and paste. It's garbage. Anyway, it was gonna. Mac it was user. gonna dox. Now, user. I should only dox one person's email per cast. So uh, this one's on poor Allison Chu and whoever submitted this. Okay. All right. So uh, so what do we know about this? Well, we here's what I could do. If I'm an MSP and I'm listening to this call, the first thing you should do is you should say, "Hey, it, TSBI Sal, this is a phishing link." I know it's a phishing link because it's not legit and they can rest there and be done, right? Now, what an Intel analyst should not do is stop there, right? An Intel analyst should say, great, thank you for providing me. This is step one. Well, what can I do from it from here? I know for sure this is phishing. I can see the 0365 overlay. I know they're trying to harvest my credentials. I know all of that. So should I just produce and share out this URL and be done with it? Well, I can. <coughs> the whole TTP pyramid of pain. How useful is that only to share just that piece? It's probably going to be, yeah, it'll be yeah. useful for a few hours, maybe a day or two or three at the most before this thing gets shut down, right? So what can I do with all this? Well, I don't know. Let's play around with it. And again, again keep in mind, I've got this one open because I know this one's a little better. So if this one fails hard on me, then uh, I'm going to go back and, and bunt. Uh, so let's just take this. Actually, let's just take the domain, right? Control C because that's what we use in the world of PC. And one of the things I can do, one of the things I like to do, is I like to just do some um, passive DNS searching. You guys know what passive D DNS is? No. So, so passive DNS, so think of it as, uh, you know, DNS data we've observed around various IPs and hosts and stuff like that. And this is not going to work, actually. Um, and I'm going to tell him why right now. Um, sorry. Clear HTTP. Well, so, so we did include HTTP, but then, uh, hey, Wes, go back to uh, go back to that tab. Um, it's actually hidden behind Cloudflare right now. So, uh, oh. I'm a, okay, uh, this is why <laughs> I did see that actually. Yeah. So, uh, so Greg, uh, go grab that one 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 IP actually out of that, uh, or or you can grab the the XYZ domain, whichever. Um, yeah. No. Now I'm. Let's take the second one. Yeah, I'll just grab that guy there. And so let's go through and see maybe if we can figure out some stuff around this. Uh, by the way, that's a DGA. Uh, 
uh, a uh, algorithmically uh, generated domain. Shocker, right? Oh, let's see. Oh, look. Why is it sending out a request to Facebook? What the hell? What, what kind of crap are you putting? All right, so <laughs> so we've got all kinds of stuff here. Hey, look, uh, the the A record on this this one 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 IP address. Let's uh, let's go ahead and drill into that. Yeah, and do quick. you see do you see the key in there? It's okay. Did you see there was three hundred sixty six? Yeah. Now we're like, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, look, so yeah. I could definitely share those domains, it's, but if there's three hundred sixty five hits on a DGA. I'd probably serve my threat intel sharing community better by not just checking that domain, but checking the IP and seeing what else belongs to it. Yeah. And ta-da, look at all this. So, I mean, all of a sudden, we have all, all kinds of stuff here. Uh, you know, here's, here's yet probably another DGA, right? You know, all these, all these look kind of funny. Uh, there's just all kinds of you stuff. You want to explain what reverse DNS is real quick? Yeah. So, passive so, DNS. Sorry. Yeah, passive DNS. All right. So, anyways, it is uh, DNS that's been observed on the internet. It's the history of, of, of DNS records for particular IPs and domains, right? You know, what did this look like? What what have I seen around this IP address? Other than that, uh, stuff that's not necessarily achievable through a, a, a reverse DNS lookup because it may not respond. But, you know, kind of, again, that digital exhaust around what have I seen in, in DNS data around this? Um, it's, it's one of the reasons that, honestly, uh, us as security practitioners are kind of sad that, you know, uh, uh, DNS is going over, over TLS now, right? You know, starting to default to that because you actually lose quite a bit of visibility into what's going on in a lot of infrastructure. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll end up, you know, making the tools better and adapting, but really for a very, a, a very long time, it's been, uh, you know, one of those things that, uh, that has been really important. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, passive DNS really is just, you know, like I said, looking at that digital exhaust of DNS traffic around the world. Okay, so what can I do with this? Well, uh, let's just do something down and dirty, right? So we say, hey, a bunch of these domains are nasty. Now, you and all, you, we all know I could probably export these or maybe an API. Um, could at least dump it into, like, I don't know, like Excel or something. But one of the things MISP is actually decently good at is if I want to take all of these and I want to share these back out, right? And, and obviously, again, keep in mind, I know there's four pages worth, right? But let's just take these. Let's just do this really simple, right? So one of the things I want to do is I want to say, hey, I want to be able to share this. So I'm going to go and I'm going to, this is what the Intel analyst should do. They should say, I'm going to add an event. Uh, I am going to give this a date. I'm going to say we're still, man, let's just say we're ongoing in the middle of this. Um, let's just say 0365 fish, and we're going to let it dynamically generate the UUID. And then what I can do here is this brings up, now I've got, I've, I've, I've kind of created the indicator, right? This is like that high level, hey, here's what we know about it. But we're not, there's nothing here that kind of tells us what we should be looking for, right? Like you saw in some of those sticks examples. So let's create some of that. So there's a lot of different things that you, one of the things that's kind of baller, you can actually legitimately upload anything you want into this, including malware. Uh, so you can even uh, load live malware and, and put this in here. Now, you, we, they highly recommend that you uh, check that it's malware so it actually is encrypted and hashes it and it works off the hash instead. Um, but what we want to do is we are going to populate this from free, free text import. So watch this. So I'm going to say, hey, here you go, miss. This is a bunch of badness. Pop this guy in here. And it's going to come back and say, okay, cool. Here's what I see out of it. And notice MISP is decently good at kind of taking out all the extra junk that may exist in the freeform text. And look at this. It's pretty smart. It actually knows that this is network activity. We could change some of these things if we, if we need to. Um, we could even change some of the types that exist. But it's pretty smart. It knows that most of these guys are host names. Um, some of these may be like a full URL, although I think, no, we, no they no. won't because it's passive DNS, yeah. right? So this is just going to be raw DNS, right? So look at this, like right out of the gate, bam, done. This is good, right? So I'm going to submit this. And then what that's going to do is it's going to tell MISP, hey, some of the things that I'm, I'm submitting inside of all of this, uh, I may have to, oh yeah, it's being processed. So I'm impatient. I'm just going to refresh because that's how I roll. So he says, don't wait. That's what kind of name? Uh, uh, so... While that's loading in, uh, can we have whoever developed that uh, go work for ConnectWise and have that feature available for all of their product lines? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. I feel like I want to. I just want to paste things in, please. Please. And, and let me no add comment. It. IT glue. IT glue as well. Get them involved. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no comment. 
Okay, right. let's, um, so that's good, right? So in notice, you know, they all show up, lots of good stuff. Um, now, what you guys aren't even looking at is over here, because you, you never probably see anything over here, but let's do something. Let's add an attribute, and let's say... Um, uh, add Google uh, DNS. Okay. Try 8.8.8.8. So, I don't know if it'll work or network not. Network activity. We're going to do, instead of, like, pasting something in, let's add in an IP destination uh, let's say, and whatever in here is fine. Okay, I think this should work. This should fire the warning list. I mean, if anything would, this this should, right? Yep. So I'm going to hit submit. And, and what am I doing? I'm pretending that, like, some of the intelligence that, you know, some of the, what the malware did is it did a ping out to 88888, right? Something like that, right? And so we're submitting this accidentally, bing, look at that, or boom, look at bing, bing and boom, bing, 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 bing. bing. The Bing taught me this. He, he, he uses Max, but he likes Bing. I mean, I'm, really, this is going down. <laughs> I'm a couple bourbons then. Immediately fired. Okay. So <laughs> notice what Miss Miss Smart. It's like, hey, yo, you've, you've signed up to this warning list. You've at least given one that has a warning because it's a list of an IP for uh, public DNS resolver. So I'm going to click on this guy, and this will bring me back. Now, this is where Miss kind of sucks. Um, uh, it's going to try to load. There it goes. So it, it gives me the whole list. <laughs> <laughs> That's not helpful. You don't know which one you added. <laughs> I, I, yeah, it's it's not totally helpful. Thank you, Miss. You can see why it took so long to load. It's like, okay, you asked for the ass long list. I'm going to do the ass long list. <laughs> However, right there, it Oh, it highlights it right there. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. That's not so better. bad. <laughs> so now the analyst says, oh, you know what? E, that's kind of bad because that one got hit. It's listed. I should probably at least uncheck it. But probably more than that, I might want to just delete the whole thing, right? Because we know that one is is really, really bad. Does this all kind of make sense how all this works? Yeah. Pretty it's simple. Pretty cool. right? It's very intuitive. And it is, yep. And, of course, this is unpublished right now. The second I publish this, then this goes live to all of my community members. They can now not only download this, um, but they can even grab it directly over an API if they're doing anything smart and sophisticated, like grab it as, like, Suricata rules, for example, and then actually grab this and, and use it to detect on, or Yara rules if they're doing something there, right? Um, so you can kind of see how powerful all of this is. Very, very easy to be able to create intelligence. Um, you can see all of this right here. Um, now, one of the other things that I can do, have you guys ever heard of hybrid analysis? No. Let's okay. just go with no for any of these questions. All right. So I'm just going <laughs> to... So hybrid Until analysis... Until you get to virus total. I know virus total. Okay. Well, okay. Okay. All right. Cool. So so virus total and hybrid analysis, same thing. They're just sandboxes, right? Now, um, virus total is a little bit different in that it is, um, what would you call it, politically rigs, a way for Google to suck in more information, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Whereas... Yeah. Hybrid analysis, they actually tell you down here it's run by CrowdStrike, right? And so what made CrowdStrike so famous is um, really great visibility. We're big friends with CrowdStrike at Perch. We know them really well. Um, and what they have is a free sandbox that anybody can deploy anything to. So you can give them a URL. You can give them a uh, domain. You can give them whatever um, – uh, or a file, whatever you want. It'll, it'll run it through their sandbox, right? Um, I have – so I have a little more access than I think most people would, but let's just take uh, an example of this, right? So a um, whole bunch of different things that uh, you can just scroll through, <laughs> like literally uh, all of the uh, sandbox data that people have given it. Um, and you can, by the way, find some very interesting information here sometimes, uh, but let's just pick one. Let's scroll down and let's see if we can find can one that looks the automate installer through there? <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Uh, you know what I would like to find? Wow, this is interesting. PowerPoint. I was, I was just going to point that out, but you kept scrolling. Look at that red score, too. Yeah. All right. Honestly, so. They almost have to deal with PowerPoint, so they just automatically make it a malicious threat. Yeah, yes. Amen. So, oh, oh, look, it had animations. Obviously malicious. <laughs> All right, so a few different things that walk through all of this. Um, you know, some network behavior, we can look at some of that. Look, they actually classify this back to MITRE attack. Yeah, so I can actually, let's just take a look at that real quick. So, clicky, there we are. Boom. Now, is this perfect? No. But is it a starting point? Yes. Really, really cool. cool. Yeah. Uh, here is the, here's where it goes. Okay, so take a look at this for a minute. Is that nasty? No. No. Is that nasty? No. Is that nasty? Um, well, one second. Why is it? Why is it? Why is a PowerPoint file communicating with the web? Forget okay, it for a second. It's not. This is not a binary. This is a PowerPoint file. So, so it depends. It, it, 
it could have external uh, um, media in it, right? Um, and maybe it's being delivered over HTTPS, mm-hmm. and so those may be totally legit. Or has but can you can you write VB in PowerPoint? Uh, oh yeah, absolutely, you can. Yeah, so that looks that, that looks legit. <laughs> yeah, oh, that, yeah, it's got a macro <laughs> and whatever or something. <laughs> so, so That's now definitely there's... legit, man. <laughs> Not to mention, it's already blocked external pictures. Yes. From that screenshot, but I'm gonna let the malware run. But you can't have your <laughs> yeah. external pictures. <laughs> okay. I wonder if they have animation or uh, transitions on every single letter. Well, <laughs> how about? Oh, I'm not logged in anymore. Hold on, let's fix this real quick. Nope. Uh, I'll do the other one. Yeah, there you go. Your account's no good. Yeah, Wes doesn't like my account. He wants his account. Probably because it's got those super special features on it that no one else has. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I was about to say, dispenser. we should just download the sample and run it on your machine. Sounds right? fantastic. And find out what it does. Yeah, it's a good idea. So, <laughs> um, I, I love your username. Uh, why? Thank you. It's fantastic. Yeah. Is why? Thank you. All right. I appreciate that, and thank you for noticing the fine details in life. <laughs> well, I've already seen them. Okay, the Do you have Wireshark? Uh, yes. Well. I- I do you, you probably don't have Wireshark. Uh, in no, I uninstalled it off this box. Uh, okay, but let's do this. Know, you know, I might actually download the PCAP. I'm curious. All right, now we're. Uh, yeah, no, I do have Wireshark. Dude, yep, you have all. It. all right. <laughs> what kind of self-respecting geek would actually remove Wild right? Wireshark? So we did we did capture the flag okay. first the other day. Oh, uh, update. Think, uh, oh, oh, update. Skip the version. version. Boom! There it is. Tell me how cool that is. So this is the sandboxes PCAP. That's really cool. And I don't understand it's... any of that. My brain's already starting to hurt. Oh man. Well, is... most of it's encrypted, but you can see the initial well, connection yeah. to the encryption. They, they oh yeah, that's not encrypted. <clears throat> that's a download. <laughs> that's straight up. Yeah. Uh, there's some really cool things you can do with Wireshark, like uh, actually reassembling the entire data flow. So we did a um, we did a capture the flag at Perch the other day. Uh, for a couple months, and one of the things you had to do is take a Wireshark uh, capture, reassemble the files that were actually delivered through the network streams. It was uh, <laughs> fun stuff. Uh, that does not sound fun. If, you know, unless no, if it you're was re- like on a YouTube video where people edited most of the content out. You know, if, one of those uh, jump cut things? Right. Okay, so more importantly, I'm just going to literally, I'm just going to download this MISP. Uh, so one of the cool things that HA, so let's, let me take a step back. Let's say this is a PowerPoint that was delivered through email for you, right? And you forward this over to the Intel analyst. Now the Intel analyst dumps it in the mail uh, in the sandbox of their choosing. They could use HA. They could use another one. Most of the good sandboxes that are out there will actually output all of the indicators of the things you want to search for directly into a mis-ingestible format. So now that I exported that, watch this. So I'm going to go, I'm going to import from, instead of creating a new event, I'm going to import this as a misp standard object i'm going to browse i have no idea what's in your downloads rig so we're just going to live large here. Uh, uh, there she be we're going to open this guy up and we are going to upload i don't want to publish right away oh hey, look at that oh, yeah, that was funny <laughs> this is the uh, the perils of doing it live black failure the request is in black hole <laughs> <laughs> let's try this again hey wait no it's right there Dare Wes. It, it imported did it It just yeah it no, just it didn't puked. Yeah, no that's from right before oh, was that the earlier yeah, oh that's the earlier one before. never mind all right let's try this that again. was the one in case it came off the rails which it seems to have <laughs> which it seems to have thanks it's it's probably a windows issue yeah, no, I don't true. think so. I wouldn't say a Windows yeah. issue, considering this is running a web server on AWS. It's, I'm going to say an AWS issue. It's probably a user issue. I, I, I'm going to say it's a PowerPoint issue. issue. Oh. Done. <laughs> yes. It is a PowerPoint <laughs> issue. Okay, so I, I plan for contingencies. Here's one I uploaded a minute ago uh, before this thing, right? So here is for a different file, of course, right? Um, but here we can see it. And then notice, because MISP is awesome... Uh, look right here. It's already told me about some of these warnings, right? So if I scroll down and I look, I can actually see somewhere here there will be a couple warnings. Now, there notice there there's like, I mean, man, this thing goes all the way into the regexes that we've seen. I mean, the um, the registry keys we've seen, right? Some really, really cool stuff that exists in all of this, right? Um, anyway, I don't care where it is. Yeah, somewhere there's it's going to be in there. I guess, but you're not going to find it. <laughs> can. Watch this. 
Boom, there's oh, one. Okay, look at that! <laughs> Good job. Sorry, and I can't Ted. tell you. So one of the things, if I were to put a perch sock analyst on the call uh, right now, one of the things they would tell you is how frustrating intelligence is. Remember when I first started this conversation about how broken intelligence is? One of the reasons it's so broken is because we see so much intelligence that has like uh, Microsoft um, uh, certificate revocation lists, CDNs up the yin-yang, things like this, raw GitHub user content, stuff like that that exists that an analyst, if only the analyst had ever taken the time to look at this compared to a warning list and say, oh yeah, wow, yuck, we should definitely not make that consumable. Uncheck that. That's literally all they have to do. They could delete it, but at least at least like uncheck that guy. Now, not only is that never going to fire for anybody, uh, everybody that detects that from here on forever forth will never pull that in as something that they have noise of something they need to triage. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's so funny because once more going redrawing the parallels again to physical security and like neighborhood watch, you know, whatever – People don't really investigate when they see something. They You get flooded with posts that don't have any relevance whatsoever because they don't do their due diligence before they post. You know? Exactly. I mean, it's just funny. You see the same thing here. Hey, Riggs. Yeah. Can you go to the DNS site? Someone's requesting the link. Oh, uh, it's yeah. Down, I... Yeah, it's, it's a tab. The DNS tab. Uh, the world's largest. I think that's it. It was like true security dot something. <laughs> security security trails dot com. It's uh, security trails dot com forward slash DNS dash trails. And, and there are many sources of passive DNS. Uh, one of the things I would encourage you to do is check out multiple sources um, because the whole nature of passive DNS yep. is based upon what you can see. Um, so uh, lots of different sources that may exist, but this is one of them. Awesome. Um, all right, back to your uh, events. Yeah, no, go good. Um, so that's that's the majority of like you know how all this works. Uh, there should be. Why did that not correlate? Let's go back to look at this. One. I don't think this is going to work very well either. Um, sometimes, yeah, both yeah, of these no. are showing the single one. But oh, you know what? Okay, here's what'll make it work. Uh, let's go back. So one of the things I didn't do in uh, MISP is I didn't enable any of any of these feeds. And so like all these threat feeds that we first started looking at, I intentionally did not ingest any of them in. So here's what I'm going to do. I checked all of them, and then I am going to... Enable selected. Enable selected. Thank you. The MISP UI is a bit of a pain. Now, I'm making MISP because I'm pulling in every single one of these default OSINT feeds directly and making them all uh, come directly in and, and, and start pulling in. So over time, if, as I begin to refresh this, you'll see more and more events start showing up from intelligence that we're just automatically pulling in from these feeds. Um, but the reason I did that is because, like, let's say this guy right here. Eventually, as more and more of these feeds finally start kind of queuing into here, one of the things that I can do is I can look at that feed, and then I can do, I can run a correlation, and I can say, hey, has this particular, any of these pieces of intelligence that I've seen ever have any relationships to any other pieces of indicators and in intelligence that's been published? If so, an intelligence analyst might want to start cluing into this, right? It's like a private investor here, going back to your, your uh, physical security, right? Saying, hey, I'm seeing a number of particular styles of carjacking attacks that are using XYZ tool that are all happening in XYZ part of the neighborhood, now I'm putting a story together, right? And that's right. the whole thing here is really kind of playing that detect. <clears throat> that's really cool. Last thing I wanted to show you, and then we'll just kind of end on some questions you may have. There's a bunch of tools that are out there. Like, there's no right or wrong way to do intelligence. Um, there's lots and lots of different... Um, uh, like websites that, that work for um, like automating and doing like uh, running threat intelligence, kind of like, hey, what else do I see and how do I dive into something more? One of the big ones I'm a fan of that I personally use a lot of is yes. this thing called Consortium Z. Now, I'm not going to show you my account because it'll expose all my APIs and that would be really bad. So I'm not going to dox <laughs> myself. Um, but what I can do can take something like this guy here and if I just want to, so think of this as an orchestrator. So um, I don't have everything set up in Consortium Z. But what I can do is I can say, hey, go grab this. 
And then what it'll do is it'll run it across multiple tools all at once, and it's going to give me back some answers. So Consortium Z is a follow-up. A friend of ours named um, uh, uh, Zepp is his last name, yeah, Jerry, Jerry Zepp, Zepp. Uh, created a really cool tool called Ocent Grabber that is now defunct and not alive anymore. He just didn't have the time to keep it up. So this Consortium Z company took his code and basically um, is now maintaining it. So when you run this, it's going to give you some who is information. Um, you can see a lot of my API keys here don't exist, so I, don't, I haven't loaded it like via total or, or x4 some of the crowd strike I, I have credentials for all of these but i haven't loaded them in this one uh, but it does come back with some um uh otx information from alien vault notice that there's a zero count on this particular fish scroll down a little bit more there's nothing here from ha so what is this telling me i'm getting zeros on this what this is really telling me more than anything is this is probably just pretty new and nothing else has seen this if i were to run something kind of old and through all of this i'll show you an example because this particular account actually has some old ones here. If I were to take, for example, this IP address. That's the one we had earlier. Remember, this IP address is the one that, yeah, that we ran here. Um, it's this IP If I go back. Uh, it's well, going. Is it going? Yep. It's just yeah. taking its... Yeah. Look at the top bar. It's got 365 IP, uh, DNS records to go through. That's right. A couple of things, right? <clears throat> okay. So, yeah, obviously being in Malaysia is, a, you know, a little concerning, um, but I can scroll down. Do, 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 do. Here we go. So a lot, uh, definitely some hits here, right? Somewhere? Uh, maybe. Uh, no. 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 Nope. Okay. So a lot H.A. Of... H.A. thinks it's malicious. Yeah, there we go. So, and keep in mind, you're, you're just looking at raw API returns back from all of this, right? So we're seeing, not only are we seeing a whole bunch of malicious hits, we're seeing a bunch of domain names that have been hit, right? So this just tells an analyst, yeah, okay, there's definitely something here that uh, that I should care about. Uh, so there are a lot of tools that exist. Um, one of a few others that like um, I would point to to go back to my famous powerpoints. Um, bring this guy back. Here we go. Where Rick is installing malicious stuff on your uh, yeah, yeah. PowerPoint. It's all good for stupid him. business stuff. Okay, here's a few. Uh, why is your PowerPoint not I don't updating? know. What's wrong? <laughs> it's PowerPoint. That's why. <laughs> Still downloading the malware. The mal hey, hey, just went back to the malware. That's what happens when you let a CISO drive. Okay, I give up. It's, uh... Here, 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 here watch. 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 It's, it's okay. <laughs> let's, go, let's go back here. The whole world's watching, dude. I know, right? The whole world. <laughs> oh. I don't know what kind of black magic he worked in his Windows world. Uh, but here's a few. So urlquery.net, urlscan.io are both you know pretty popular. We we typically use urlscan.io a lot at Perch, as you saw. Um, Threatminer, Simon are both pretty good. Um, Shodan is, is pretty awesome. You guys know what uh, Shodan's all about. I do. Uh, probably. You should, by the way, look up uh, like Screen Connect, is it? Uh, from Screen connect. connect wise, it is yeah. called control. Oh, oh, oh no, no, oh, here, no, no, no. What's no, the right. user agent though? On, oh, no, we're gonna go back to Shodan real quick. Yeah, it's up there in the middle, right it's, next to it. It's, 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 yeah. There you go. You're gonna get a lot of hits, my friends. Look at that. Look at this. Open RDP servers. To where? I don't know. Obviously, somebody in a call ConnectWise administrator. If anybody on MSP Geek Work sees with, their server yeah. on these screenshots, yeah. please we take them down. down. <laughs> oh my god, this is horrible. This is right? super right now. Connect, these are managed servers, by the way, because I know CW Admin is an account that ConnectWise wants you to create when they set up a managed server. So, uh, there's that, that company, I know what one company is, because uh, their domain, they named their Admin Don't publicly personal. call them out there. No. <laughs> they named their uh, username, their company name, probably. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. Oh. Yeah. So. <sighs> Waiting for it. Let's, let's start, you know, it's funny how we do attacking. this when everyone drops off the cast. There's 14 people watching right now. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, nope. <laughs> they're all looking, they're all running to Shodan to see if their stuff's on there. <laughs> see if their stuff's right, on there. Exactly. I mean, you know, obviously, Screen Connect, I mean, you know, those servers. Ten, yeah, ten, but you know, I mean, what else can you figure out from some of these? I mean, I can tell you the first, my first exposure to Shodan was like four or five years ago when we first started getting uh, VoIP systems hacked, and this guy I was talking to about security was like, "Listen, dude, 
go to Soda and type in SIP or port 80 or you know, the user agent of the phone, and you will get back all sorts of phones that have default username and password that you can steal credentials from, and then you can hack the phone system. Um, um, it's I just mean, ridiculous. You know, if you look at things that have port 9100 open, those are printers. You know, if you right. want to go burn the paper, you start go ahead. printing random things to paper. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, totally unethical, right? But yeah, anyways, moving on. All right. What else, Wes? Uh, so if you're interested in doing more, so obviously check out MIS, but if you just want to play with it, but again, I, there's probably not an expectation that you need to be the one that actually runs it. Um, Suricata is an awesome tool. If you actually want to like do something with with the intelligence that's coming into MIS, uh, Suricata is a great platform. By the way, that's what it's one of the big pieces of what Perch uses, um, free and open source. You should definitely check that out. Um, if you need to visualize, look at it. Uh, Elasticsearch is a big piece. And so, by the way, these are all tools that we use very heavily at Perch um, that we were sort of taking a lot of the processes that exist for others um, and sort of kind of productizing this, right? So um, let's end on this and then I'll end with uh, some, you know, whatever kind of questions you guys may have. So a, a friend, a colleague, and someone that uh, Riggs and I both greatly ex- uh, kind of respect, a guy named Nathan Fowler. So he works at a very, very, very large investment firm. Um, uh, he is probably one of the greatest um, like intelligence producers uh, that that we personally know of. He's personally named multiple malware campaigns that uh, um, have been cycled in the news. I mean, he's just he's legit, right? I love this kind of quote that he gave, and he gave me permission to share this as much as I want. So I'm just going to read it. I know you can see it, but I want to read it. So he says, "Share, share freely, and share transparently. Make no assumption on valuation. The best intelligence data I tend to receive comes from organizations who understand their uh, environment and the deviation from normalcy. What you may dismiss." misses without value is an epiphany for someone else that leads to miscreants being punched. Never be embarrassed, afraid, or uh, ashamed to share and ask questions. It's better to be corrected by peers than to asunder by miscreants. I am corrected often. So what I love about that, not just the humility in, in Nathan's statement, but also this idea of, um, you know, kind of circling back to what we were talking about. If you're a smaller or mid-sized MSP and you're like, dude, I don't have the time to do this, you may not. Um, but at least be able to share and forward on to the TSPI now the things that you're seeing, the things you care about. You know, if you see some kind of O365 fish, forward that on. And then, you know, you guys as MSPs need to have, make sure that they're accountable back yes. to you to say, hey, look, you know, we had an MSP share something. Did you guys dive into it? Did you, did you like attack it? Did you dive into all the data? Did you do, you know, did you actually find out what, what all's uh, hiding beneath the covers to this? Did you get rid of the noisy stuff out of this? And did you share it back and did you make it available for everyone else to be aware yeah. of? Um, those are the things that are really, really, really valuable. And one of the things that Fowler talks about all the time is he says, you know, I work for these massive companies. Um, the company he worked at before was called Barclays Bank, one of the biggest banks in the, in the world. He said, I have thousands upon thousands of networks that I've never seen, that I know nothing about. I can't possibly truly understand my network like you smaller orgs can. And so when a smaller org that knows their network says, I know something for a fact is malicious and yucky, he says, that is a gold mine to me because yep. I don't know my network like you guys know your networks. And so sometimes that's the tip off that I need to start something huge. And yep. so he's always saying, share, share, share. The, the two things that I think are the most important things to focus on with this quote specifically is organizations who understand their environment and the deviation from normalcy. Yes. And never be embarrassed, afraid, or ashamed to share and ask questions. Um, I think those two are the most important points because, I mean, you're, you're right. It, it's, it's our network. We know. Just throw some detection tools and let it dump all of the data that it detects and look for things that don't seem right investigate those things that don't seem right make sure they're legit or not legit fix it and continue to have that sort of layer uh you know and to make sure that you can see what's (coughs) changing inside your network and systems and make sure you have someone responsible for (laughs) 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 the perfect perfect segue (laughs) make sure you have someone responsible (laughs) For managing the internal <laughs> processes of the network and systems that run, and because yes. having, you know, a deviation of normalcy is a huge red flag. Um, I I like to share this story because I think it's hilarious. Um, the very f- my my previous <clears throat> IT company that I worked for was one of the very first people to get crypto locker. One of our receptionists who had access to uh our public drive uh, specific accounting folder um, 
clicked on a malicious link through a fish, downloaded and ran a crypto wall. So it was like one of the very like super early. Like we didn't even know what it was. We just wiped her computer early. So we wiped her computer and we restored the files from the drive. Not much damaged. A couple hours worth of work gone. You know, it is what it is. Move on with our lives. Um, but it, it it's things like that that, you know, we didn't have internal phishing training. We didn't have, uh, you know, education for people who aren't technical savvy, which have to be in businesses nowadays. Because um, you got receptionists, you've got marketing individuals, you've got all kinds of other individuals inside your company that are have, that have access to all this amazing tools that you guys use to that everyone uses uh, in MSP Geek community to um, service your clients, and they may have higher permission sets than what they should have. They may have <coughs> um, access to systems they shouldn't have, um, and they may not be as technically literate as uh, they should be um, in their positions of quote-unquote power. Um, so it, it's important to make sure that you have someone. Bring it up to the CEO, the owner, whatever. Talk to someone about it. Say, hey, it's important that we go. Because I know I'm saying this is going to be bad, but they're targeting MSPs nowadays. It's becoming more and more in the news. They're pushing more and more to target MSPs because we're, we're a cookie jar. You get access to the cookie jar, you get access to all these wonderful cookies. Yep. And they will devour them insanely quickly. <laughs> and I mean, we've seen a couple of MSPs got hit that have, that have not recovered. And we've seen some that have gotten hit that have recovered miraculously. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... it's, um, it's I can tell you personally, I am terrified if I don't, I don't understand or I can't even comprehend how what we would do in a situation to even recover from something like that because of the amount of agents that we have and the resources it would take. I don't understand. I, I mean, I would just, there's nothing that we could even start doing. Um, I mean, just, but, just, I mean, just think about the scenario of all of your clients have been crypto lockered. Your systems have been crypto lockered. And they're and all they're, asking for, uh, let's say, a total of like tw- 200 grand to unlock everything. What do you do? Because not only do you have to restore your systems to get access back into everyone else's systems, but you can't do well, anything. Well, depending on systems. your security, your backups <laughs> themselves may be encrypted. That too. Um, and then you just lost all your data. And it's like you're talking about lawsuits. You're talking about whether or not you're still in business. You're talking about, I mean, it's <laughs> putting other people out of business. I mean, it's crazy. It's, it's, it's. It's scary. It's super right. scary just to think about it. And because, you, you know, even at, you know, in 2013, when I started working in MSPs and technology in general, um, you don't think about those things as you should. It's, you know, you don't think about, well, <clears throat> my computer's unlocked locally. No one's going to mess with our stuff. Um, but what about that new client that they just brought in who's touring the systems? Um, and your office is kind of out of the way. Your computer's not locked. Oh, l- let me tie my shoe real quick. I'll catch up in a second. Boom, he has access to your office. He just plugs in a USB drive and it's gone. Or, uh, you know, a new vendor you're, you're touring around your place. You know, physical security, digital security. Uh, it's, it, it, there's so much to comprehend in the cybersecurity space nowadays. Um, I mean, the, the, the recap is basically what we're talking about here is, number one, even if you don't have the time to chase down everything, if you join the TSP ISAL or something similar, you want to make sure it's it's one where the experts, that they're going to be doing the work, the analysis for you. Um, make sure that they don't provide bad or false information because it harms you as much as it harms the other people. Um, you want to make sure that you consider your own security from the MITRE attack phases. You know, Each one is a failure domain of sorts that you need to make sure is protected um, starting from the beginning all the way to the end, in terms of an impact, how do you recover from such a thing? Because, again, disaster recovery and rel- and reliability of services is still considered part of security. I mean, that's basically the recap I got from this yeah. great cast. Um, and I think another good takeaway is if you can't do it or you can't dedicate an individual to do it, pay a company that will <coughs> perch. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> I was going to do the coughing, but okay. <laughs> um, but I mean, it, it's, it's true. I mean, Perch is a, a great product. Uh, there's, I mean, 
uh, in my experiences with everyone at Perch, they're super knowledgeable about everything they've done. Um, and I know I'm plugging them, but it, it, I'm just being honest at this point. Um, they're super knowledgeable. They're super nice. They're super understanding. And they're willing to expand their products if they, if they find a need for it. Um, and their developers are super smart. I've met a few of them. Um, and uh, they like the good languages and hate the bad ones. So uh, I relate very well with them. Um, and they use XML. They used to use XML. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. I quit. Purchase bad. Don't use it. Um, <laughs> I figured we were saying too many nice things, you know. I just yeah, have to cut it right. off. Um, <laughs> but I mean, there's there's several of these vendors in the community, and Press yeah. just happens oh. to be one of them. So yeah. I, uh, I do appreciate you guys coming on and uh, ch- chatting with us about uh, thready threats. Um, oh, so, thank you, uh, Riggs. I have to ask this. Yeah. Why is your username everywhere MSN Riggs? Uh, because <laughs> because I was blessed with two two middle names that are S and N. Okay, because it looks like you really like Microsoft. <laughs> yeah, he likes the old MSN Messenger. He won't get away from it. I mean, it makes sense. You're the <laughs> only user on it. I mean, I went from I went from ICQ to AOL to MSN. I mean, you're out right. It's now. <laughs> <laughs> Now I'm just uh, aging okay. myself. Um, <laughs> hey, I used I, I went the reverse. I used uh, uh, MSN, AIM, and then ICQ, and then Ventrilo, and then all through the vocal ones. Dang. Oh, IRC. Dang. That was a big one back yeah, in the day. I, yeah, I, yeah, IRC was the the granddaddy of them all. Yeah, no, it's uh, it was it was always a unique username that I know I can grab pretty much anywhere. True. It, you're not wrong. No one's gonna represent MSN. Yep. <laughs> uh, with that note I'd like to thank everybody for watching this amazing key cast that's been going on for an extremely long time and I'm going to let Kyle finish the closing notes yeah so uh, to, to recap um, purchase great you should probably look into purchasing them set up a demo something do good um, and buy stuff from MSP Geek store buy stuff from MSP Geek PurchaCon is in a few weeks uh, you can all caps MSP Geek get money off I think it's 50, 50 bucks, bucks. <clears throat> so if you're looking to go to PurchaCon, it's in Tampa, right? Yep, it is. And it's 50 here right now. It's really it's 50, not all that great. 50 degrees. <laughs> 50 degrees. 50 degrees warm. Yes, that's um, true. Cold as it gets. Uh, yeah. Pretty. Um, uh, frankly, MSP also has a con uh, in the middle of January. Um, I believe the MSP Geek Code there works as well. I think it's $100 off. Um, so if you have questions about stuff like that, feel free to let me know. Um, I'll get you to the right people. Um and uh, again, thanks, guys, uh, for coming on and sharing us this fantastic information. Now I'm going to go cry myself to sleep. Appreciate yeah. <laughs> you, Perch. Yeah. Take care, everyone. All right, guys. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.